please. Uh, I need a motion to return to open session. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by stating aye. Aye. I need a motion to certify closed session that the only items that we discussed in the closed session was those items that were in the enabling motion and those items that are in court with the Freedom of Information Act. So moved. So moved. Second. Roll call, please. Ms. Bond? Yes. Ms. Franklin? Yes. Mr. Ivers? Yes. Ms. Coran? Yes. Mr. Lyons? Yes. Ms. Woolsey? Yes. Mr. Jones? Yes. You do an honors awards recognition. Mr. Staten? Yes. Okay. Next item on our agenda is honors awards and recognition. Uh, this is where the board takes an opportunity to recognize the outstanding accomplish accomplishments of our student athletes and others within the districts. And at this time, I'm going to turn the uh, dais podium over to Dr. Staten. Thank you. Uh, at this time, we'll ask um, Dr. Graham to come forward, please. Mr. Jones said this is the time when we take a moment to uh, honor some of our students and I would like <coughs> Jennifer Weaver, our Director of Secondary Education, to come forth and present the first group. Good evening. As you can see, we have a room full of talented athletes for you tonight. Um, we always use this meeting to recognize all of our successful spring sport athletes. So I'd like to begin this evening with Christiansburg High School and here to represent them is Coach Sean Bossman. Mm -hmm. Good evening. First of all, I want to thank the board um, and everybody uh, for letting us join us tonight to be recognized for our accomplishment um, an outdoor 3A boys state title last year that we uh, achieved. Um, first, I'd like to have the members of my team that joined me today, uh, Mackenzie Muldoon, Aaron Cridlin, Mitchell Walters, Kendall Smith, Darius Smith, Jordan Norman, Aaron Lowe, join me please. Um, unfortunately, we don't have everybody here. Uh, as some of our graduates have moved on to college at CNU in Bluefield um, and a Tech College in uh, Florida, Dr. Sears is here. Um, we're just very thankful to have this opportunity to get recognized. I know um, these few individuals here plus the rest of my team worked hard and able to achieve something Christopher High School hasn't done in history and uh, get an outdoor state title to add on to our indoor state title that we achieved last year and it was a wonderful year for me being first year um, taking over a program that Coach Quinn, unfortunately it's his birthday today, um, <laughs> unable our AD to make it today. Um, but we're just happy to be here and uh, the few, Mackenzie Muldoon, um, he was our two-time state champ in the fall, win state title and the long jump and the 110 hurdles. Um, Aaron Cridlin was top uh, top three in the pole vault. Mitchell and Darius Smith and Jordan Norman part of our relay four by one. Uh, Kendall Smith was part of our four by four and four by eight all state team. And Aaron Lowe was part of our uh, all state four by eight team. And Tanner Reed and Jordan Finn also with us. Jordan Finn was our only other state champion in the shot put. and. Um, we're just happy to be here, and thank you guys for the recognition. Thank you. Uh, Coach, I think it should be pointed out that your team had a great point average. Do you know what it was? Uh, I do not remember. I think it was about a 2.5, two, no, two, two somewhere close to that range. Wasn't it, Kevin? The, Oh, I'm yeah. sorry, 3-2, I'm sorry, 3-2. Yeah. Yes, a 3-2 grade point average. Well, yeah, so, I was say that. They really so, that. so yeah. what, one, one, yeah. one, I, I got that information from Kevin, I turned it around. The point is, they, and I want to correct Ms. Weaver, they're student athletes, because they did have a 3.2, and I think that's wonderful.
Next, I'd like to take a minute to introduce our new athletic director at Blacksburg High School, Mr. Peter Lyles, here this evening. Good evening, members of the board. Thank you for having us out tonight in recognition of three of our spring sports programs that have reached the pinnacle of success. Uh, although I was not here last spring, it is truly an athletic director's dream to be part of these uh, types of programs. These kids uh, obviously worked hard with uh, the VHSL having over 350 member schools and only six in those particular divisions reaching this pinnacle. Uh, we have much to be uh, celebrating tonight and a lot of joy. I want to introduce, uh, starting with our soccer program, uh, Coach Travis Eschenman could not be with us tonight, but I have a representative from his team along with some teammates, uh, Jane Everett, the cap junior captain, Jane Everett. She's now a senior. Jane? Uh, hi, I'm Jane Everett. I was the junior captain this past season. Um, this season was truly a definitely special season for us because we faced a lot of conflict and adversity with injuries. We had four of our important starters sidelined for most of the season um, because of those injuries. And But that made our team come together and work harder. and. All of the younger players especially worked really hard to move up and help with our success. Um, we achieved uh, the Conference 32 title and the 3A West Region Championship. And in re regular season play, we scored 72 goals opposed to four goals from other teams. And in postseason, we scored 21 goals to three. So. We scored a total of 93 goals, and which was the highest um, a team has ever done in program history. But really, the true, the truly special thing about our team this year was that we finally won the state title. <laughs> <laughs> and um, after, like, in program history, it was since 1995 when it was first established in 2014 this was the first time that the girls had ever gotten the title and it was really truly great being a part of such a great team with really hardworking teammates and it's a great year but thank you again for the school board for letting us talk Their grade point average was 3.64. Next, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing our tennis coach, Magdalena Kinska. Hey, uh, I would like to thank you all for, uh, for your support. It's been a really long time since boys tennis team had any accomplishments like that. We won singles title, state championship, first time since 20 years. And the guy that did it was Thomas Dacker. <laughs> and now we also won a doubles championship and that didn't happen in about 10, maybe 15 years. And that was his partner, Ryan Wells. like to thank for your support and the opportunity to work with the kids and in their name just having a chance to be part of school sport. Thank you. And last but certainly not least on our end, uh, representing our girls track team, and this is not his first rodeo, uh, Coach James DeMarco. 
he uh, fulfilled the Triple Crown by capturing the state title in track. So, Coach DeMarco. <clears throat> Thank you, members of the board, for having us here tonight. Um, it's always an honor uh, to recognize our student athletes. Uh, they had a tremendous season. Our girls team won the cross country state championship, the indoor state championship, and the outdoor track and field cha championships, which is the triple crown. It's a r really rare feat to pull off. And uh, through their diligence in the classroom and um, finding that extra time to put the work in um, outside the classroom and in the weight room, um, on the trails and on the track, uh, they succeeded in their goals. Um, we have tonight just two of our young ladies with us. Uh, can we bring up Jennifer Fleming and Stephanie Gardner? Uh, Stephanie is only a freshman. Uh, she'll be a, now she's a sophomore. Sorry, for <laughs> Stephanie. And uh, she was an all-state hurdler for us. Broke uh, 48 seconds in the hurdle, running 47.98. Ran her best time of the season at the state championships to earn all-state honors. And then beside her was our fastest miler on the team. She ran a 457 miler. She'll be a senior this year and is being heavily recruited by lots and lots of universities and uh, uh, seven, a great leader for our team. And uh, these two ladies will help uh, our new group of young kids that came out, and hopefully we can continue the tradition of winning some more uh, championship titles. I would like to also give a big thanks to uh, Brandon Bear, who's my, one of my assistant coaches that's here tonight. Uh, Steve Schmidt, Kathleen Poole, and Mark Henson could not be here tonight. And also Mr. Jack Kinky, uh, Coaches that also help make our program run. Um, indoor track, we have about 120 kids, and outdoor track, about 100. So it's a true team effort, um, and I would be amiss if I didn't recognize them because it's not my coaching, it's the team of coaches coming together and, and getting this done with wonderful, absolutely wonderful athletes, parents, and in our administration. To be a part of um, the success Blacksburg High School had last year to win the Wachovia Cup again, to see the girls' soccer team win their first one, and the tennis team, to be in the new building together, that energy was so refreshing to see that we had lost over the last few years. So uh, we thank everybody in the community for making it happen and uh, uh, for bringing the, all the kids together under one roof. And uh, it was just an amazing, amazing uh, experience to have that again. Thank you so much. And last but not least, we have Paul Dominey, the athletic director from Auburn High School. Um, I need to begin by saying what a pleasure it is to be standing up here in front of you again, and I hope to make this a regular event for Auburn. Uh, after winning four state championships in the first 100 years or so, Auburn athletes won two state championships last year, uh, and we have our eyes on more. Uh, the second of those championships is why I'm here tonight uh, to present to you the Auburn boys track team. When the season began, and even through the regional championships, few people thought uh, that this Auburn team had a chance to win a state title with this particular group of young men. Uh, even the week before the state championship, an opponent we shall not name from a city abutting Montgomery County publicly pronounced in the newspaper their rivals for the state title. Auburn was not on that list. This team, however, had a different idea. Uh, it was observed during the celebration dinner after the state championship that while other teams were composed of outstanding looking athletes. Everyone on our team, quote, is either 100 pounds or 300 pounds. <laughs> and that was kind of funny because as you can tell looking around, it's kind of true. <laughs> but what other schools and coaches missed was that each of these athletes here had been honed for their specialty and they were all very, very good. Track and field is an individual sport but it's scored as a team contest. And the final team score 
showed Auburn the champion by a 75 to 73 tally over Alta Vista and 54 other schools. It was the next to the slimmest of margins, and afterwards, it was noted that there were contributions that we could not have done without. Uh, the 4x800 team of Jared Downing, uh, and uh, guys, if you could just each uh, step forward or wave so that uh, the school board knows who you are. Uh, Trevor Domini, Caleb Hallinan, and Andrew Frazier started the meet with a warning shot to the other schools, placing second uh, in their relay after being seated seventh. Obviously, the performances of state champion Michael Hinckley in the shot put, uh, who cannot be here tonight because he's playing college football, uh, and Austin Crockett in the pole vault uh, were critical. Caleb Hallinan and his sore knees placed fourth in the, four, in the 800 to gain three more points than expected. We won by two. Jared Downing ran both the 1600 and the 3200 to pick up 12 points. The pole vaulters, uh, Trevor Domini, Ethan Crockett, and his brother Austin collected 23 points uh, for the team. Gavin Hogue uh, placed fourth in the discus on a broken foot for five points. And Josh Fleener, who had placed fourth in the shot put, performed surprisingly well in the, in the discus to place seventh, picking up two points. Did I mention we won the meet by two points? <laughs> <laughs> you, may have, you may have noticed that I haven't mentioned the sprinters yet. Uh, Justin Kraft, Justin Light, Jordan Fleener, and Austin Crockett ran a flawless 4x100 that placed seventh in the state for, yes, you guessed it, two points. <laughs> so, the young men that I present to you tonight are a group of individuals who combined their specific abilities to become the greatest of all boys track teams in 1A in Virginia last spring. Each one standing here was absolutely essential to the success of the team. And that is why they stand here to be honored tonight. This is your Auburn Eagles boys track team. At this time, the board will take a five minute recess so that they may personally congratulate all the students that we recognize tonight. Yes, and this is where the board sets aside 30 minutes to allow citizens to address this board on items of educational interest. Uh, part of the process is that you come to the dais, we'd ask for you to state your name and address. You have three minutes to speak, and we do have a, uh, on the screens over here, we do have a clock that monitors the time, and we ask that you respect that. We have three people signed up this evening, and they go in order as they've signed up. The first person is Pamela Flinch. I hope I said the last name correctly. Hello, I'm Hannah Murtis, and I'm a sophomore at Blacksburg High School. And my address is 3002 Tall Oaks Drive, Blacksburg, Virginia, 24060. And I'm Pamela Flinch. I'm a junior at Blacksburg High School, and my address is 402 Seminole Drive. We are members of an organization called Y Street. Y Street is a program of the Virginia Foundation of Health for Healthy Youth and is Virginia's largest youth-led movement. We, prov we promote Healthier Virginia. This is both Hannah and my second year as Y Street members. Did you know one fourth of our Virginia youth are overweight or obese? So next time you walk into a classroom in Montgomery County, imagine one of the four students there are overweight. Even though the Centers for Disease Control recommends 150 minutes of physical education per week of K through five students, less than 10% of schools in Virginia actually follow this recommendation. We at Y Street are attempting to make Virginia healthier by requesting that schools offer 30 minutes of physical education a day through the ACT OUT campaign. 
PE not only promotes healthier lifestyles for students, but also improves students' academic performances and test scores. I know as a county, we are on a strict budget, but implementing these programs does not have to be expensive. The average PE budget for schools is only $764 a year. Additionally, the ACT OUT campaign collected 15,847 surveys and found that 94% of Virginia supports this cause. Also, 97% of teachers support requiring at least 2.5 hours of PE per week in grades K through 8. We support ACT OUT because we believe every child should have the opportunity to participate in physical education. In our own Montgomery County, 1,571 resident, residents support, have filled out support cards and 28 residents have filled out photo pledges supporting daily PE. And our school pin, principal, Brian Kitts, supports ACT OUT too. We look forward to the opportunity discuss, to discuss this with you further. We would appreciate working together with you to bring daily physic physical education to our school division. Thank you so much for your time. We are willing to answer any questions that you might have. Usually during public address, the board does not respond, but as part of the process under new business, the board may request additional information. Thank you for your time. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. The next person signed up is Zach Edelman. Can I hand these out to the board? Sure. Just to hand it to one and then let them pass it around. That would be great. Thank you. Thank you, members of the board. My name is Zach Edelman. My address is 504 Monte Vista Drive in Blacksburg. I live in the Margaret Beaks district. Uh, my daughters are not yet school age, and so my questions or my uh, information I'd like to address the board about concerns kindergarten enrollment. The first page I handed out is found as a printout of your website on enrollment, and it states, and I'll just read one sentence, students with birthdays on October 1st or after must wait until the following school year. And of course, um, that ignores a lot of developmental psychology and child psychology about when children are ready for kindergarten. And uh, my wife and I started looking around for, um, is it possible to admit students that have a birthday after that, shortly after that, any time like that. And so we met with the principal at Margaret Beeks. We talked to Lois Graham, the assistant superintendent. Um, we met with uh, Ms. Karen on the, on the school board. And, uh, and then we did a lot of research outside looking at policies of other counties about who has who allows exceptions. And uh, it turns out many of the neighboring counties do allow exceptions. And so this was very strange, the sentence that we see that, that Montgomery does not, and we've heard this from a lot of uh, other teachers, from our daycare, from other parents, that, and, uh, and talking with Lois Graham, that the board basically does not, or the school district does not ever allow this, and there are never any exceptions, and there's no leeway here. Um, and it was very confusing to me. So I came here, my original intent to address the board was to ask the board to uh, potentially draft a policy that would allow exceptions based on any criteria that, that they may seem fit. But as I started uh, navigating the website, I came across an actual policy for admission. This is the second page. And, if we, and this is a policy that was last revised in September of 2013 by the board. And on the back side, under admissions, number four, persons that are not required to be admitted may be admitted if they're determined that such space is available, and they may be admitted if they will not appear, impair the usefulness and efficiency of the school, and they may be charged tuition. And so now I became very confused, because on one hand, the public face of the website is saying, we can never do it. But the actual school board policy says, of course you can do it, and here's how. And so I'm asking the board to um, clarify how a parent goes about fulfilling what is in the policy, and how the school administration, um, who is responsible for making a determination that space is available and a determination that the student will not um, impair the usefulness and efficiency, um, essentially creating a pathway because it's strange that this policy has been enforced since 2004 and no one in the administration, school district, the principals, the school board ha has ever used it and no parent has ever used it. And so I'm just uh, here to bring this to the attention of the school board. Hopefully we can shed a little light on this and figure out um, how we can make this a little bit more public <coughs> and to fix the website. So that the website actually reflects uh, school board policy rather than whatever this is, I'm not sure. So, thank you. Thank you. That is, concludes all the people that have signed up for public address. At this time, I'll open it up to the audience, and if there's anyone in the audience that would like to address this board, please step forward and state your name and address.
Hello, my name is Andrea Birdke, and my address is 3160 um, Lady Slipper Lane in Blacksburg. And I came here to make an inquiry, but having heard now that the board does not actually respond when someone speaks, I'd just like to draw your attention to the policy by which when students miss the first day of school, they are automatically dismissed completely and dropped from the roster across the board and all scheduling all classes that they have been registered for. Even though they have been registered, they have been paid for, everything is taken care of. <coughs> so I'm kind of curious why it is that students are automatically removed from the rosters entirely when they miss that first day of school. I can't seem to find any information on the website or any of the handbooks for the school, the state, or the district on this policy. So I'm curious where this policy comes from and if it's at all possible for the school board to put something on their website about this policy, that would be very helpful. Could you give me your name again, please? Andrea Bertke. Spell the last name. B-E-R-T-K-E. And your address? 3160 Lady Slipper Lane. Blacksburg. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to address the board at this time? If so, <coughs> please step forward and state your name and address. Seeing no one, public address is now closed. Hmm. Next item on the agenda is the consent items. Does anybody have anything they would like to pull under consent and discuss? Mr. Jones, I'd like to bring to your attention that we added field trips. While you guys were in closed session, we realized that we had started that process but didn't actually do the final button push to, to put it in the agenda okay. for you. And that is item C under consent? Correct. And it looks like there is four items under consent for field trips. I Thank you for bringing that to our attention. I don't have that. I don't either. You may need to hit refresh on your browser. Oh. Where's that at? Oh. You have it? Okay. I've got it. I got it for it. Thank you. Any comments or questions under items that are consent? Hearing none, all those items are approved under consent. Next item on the agenda is the personnel report. And before you have a personnel report, I need a motion for approval. So moved. Second. Any discussion on the personnel report? Hearing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Yep. The, the issue that I've been opposing has been addressed with this personnel report, so therefore I'm approving it. All right. Next item on the agenda is the financial reports. I need a motion to pay the bills. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify by staying. And um, you know, we have to do individual motions on those. All those in favor signify by staying aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm abstaining uh, voting on this issue because of. My involvement with Cross Point uh, Conference Center and the Foursquare Church, and I want to be in line and in tune with, in accordance to the uh, Virginia state law that requires me to make such a abstain. I guess abstaining. Abstention. Abstention. That's the word I was looking for. Abstention. <laughs> Next item is item B, the financial summary report. I need a motion to approve that as well. So moved. Second. Any discussion on the financial summary report? All those in favor signify by staying aye. 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 Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the superintendent's reports, recommendations, and announcements. And I'm going to turn it over to Dr. State. Thank you, Mr. Jones. Uh, good evening again, um, board members. And we have several items uh, to present tonight. Uh, the first item is the school crisis plan, it, which will be presented um, for your action tonight. Dr. Lois Graham, Assistant Superintendent for Instruction, will present information for your consideration and action. <clears throat> As 
as you know, the crisis plans have been made available for you, and I know several board members did come to review those. So should you have any questions, I would be glad to answer them. But otherwise, all schools have submitted their crisis plans, and we're ready to approve them for the schools. Motion to approve. Second. Any discussion on the crisis plan? Yes, I did have a couple of questions. I actually did go in and take a look. Sorry, I was, I'd forgotten I needed to pull out my notes for that. Um, there were a couple of things I noticed in some of the, um, some of the plans that were present in some plans were not present in other plans. And I just wanted to make a recommendation that maybe we consider putting them in all of them. I did see the overall checklist of everything that needs to be put in there, but I did notice that um, there in the CHS um, provision for if there's a bomb threat, there's actually a checklist of, th of procedures to go through, and I thought it was excellent. I thought we probably need to implement that with the rest of the schools. Um, I did like the, uh, the Auburn Elementary School actually had an evaluation of how they handled each crisis. I think that was a great thing to probably implement as well. And um, this may be in a separate situate, a separate place, but it seemed like some of them made reference to incident reports, but not every school did as well. Um, we just maybe something that we want to make sure is in each one of those. And then the last question I have really was, I noticed that each crisis plan or each, for each school is required to have a student roster. And my question is, is how often does that need to be updated? And number two, how often does it get updated? They, they update it at the first of the year. We don't require the appendix, that piece is in the appendix, right. until the um, two weeks after the beginning of exactly. school. Exactly, I saw that. And then it is up to the school to update it. We yeah. usually around January, we'll put yeah. out something to make yeah. sure that they okay. have updated it. All right, very good. And I, my understanding was, I think I, I spoke with Ms. Shanks and she said that typically anyway, if there is a crisis, we actually rely upon power school Correct. for the current roster. So mm -hmm. I don't know if we need to make a note of that somewhere in the mm -hmm. pr crisis plan in and of itself, but uh, I did, that, that actually does make most the most sense. Mm -hmm. But overall, I was very pleased. It seemed like everything was very well thought out. I liked the way it was organized. It was easy for me to find everything that I needed. So thank you. Thank you. I have one comment also. It, it, it seems to me that, that there should be some more continuity amongst the, the different schools. Um, I found good continuity amongst the elementary schools the, the high school, an example, uh, an intruder comes into the building. It seemed to me that all the elementary schools handled it relatively the same way, mm -hmm. which means that if I'm a teacher in this building and I get transferred to that building, no problem. I don't need to review all this stuff. Um, the high school is not so, so much. Intruder, example, intruder coming into the building, one of the high schools um, had quite a different approach to it than the other three. It just probably a little more continuity in there so that uh, people and even police officers when they get used to one process in one building they should be able to go to the other buildings and have the same type of process just that we we can certainly address that at sure. our principals meetings I, I did mention it to to miss blackburn but i don't know mm -hmm. if she had an opportunity to, to talk to anyone about it but mm -hmm. thank you any other comments questions we have a motion on the table all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Jones, before I move to the uh, second item for discussion or second uh, presentation, I just noticed that uh, Ms. Diggs in the, uh, is in the uh, audience tonight, and I failed to um, make comment on her uh, by your actions in the personnel, by approving the personnel report. Uh, Ms. Diggs has been um, promoted to uh, supervisor for uh, <coughs> student services, so I just wanted to make certain that we publicly acknowledge <coughs> the fact that that has taken place. Congratulations. Mm -hmm. Did we did we approve that? Yes, yes, we did. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, Ms. Diggs. Okay, the second item is the certified employee evaluation handbook. This is presented uh, for your action again, uh, also tonight. 
Uh, Joe McElandre will come forward to provide you with an update. Thank you, Dr. Staten. Um, there have been no changes since the last I presented it to you. Um, again, I think the biggest change in the um, handbook itself is that uh, upper range where we made it uh, a little bit more in line with the state and with uh, other counties um, that have implemented this similar plan. A question that I'm maybe I would be able to answer by looking at this more deeply, but um, I understand that the teachers are graded heavily on in, in the scoring range with their scores on SOLs. Um, what about teachers that don't teach students that are taking an SOL, like, for example, a guidance counselor or a music teacher? Yes, ma'am. They, they all have to get with their administrator and, and discuss um, the student growth performance, um, how they're going to be measured for that year. They're not always based on SOLs because, uh, again, uh, as you pointed out, there are some grades and some subjects that um, aren't uh, connected with an SOL test. Okay. And what happens to an employee if they get a proficient score for several years in a row? What's the process? Nothing. They get a proficient. Proficient is um, is a what we. I know it, it's not a term we we like to think of as, as a great or a great teacher um, or a great uh, employee, but in this case, it's a good employee who's doing a good job meeting the the uh, expectations. And if you look through there, there's some pretty high expectations throughout that um, manual in each of those performance areas. So to get proficient is is not a bad thing. It's actually a, a really good thing to get exceeds now that's something where you step above everybody else you're the model uh, teacher and it you could be pointed to for this particular area the only time a teacher comes into subject is if they fall below that mm -hmm. in several areas and then we look at um, a possibility of looking at performance improvement plans or, or those kinds of things but again um, there is a there is a stipulation in there it says may so it, just because they score below on one doesn't mean they're going to be placed on a plan of improvement board, any other questions board members I guess everybody gets a copy of this of both of these handbooks I mean the, the employees the, that are impacted have a copy of this and on a gonna are aware that this is what they're being evaluated yes sir everybody's fully aware of those and the 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 only again the biggest changes that you see there is the is the top rating is not that the other ones basically stayed the same there was very little change in those okay um this is brought to us for action i apologize board members so at this point i'd like to request a motion for approval so moved Second. Okay, and now we're in discussion. My apologies. No, no. <laughs> Any further discussion? <laughs> I'm a little out of practice. You. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? We now have a certified handbook. Mr. Chairman, the next uh, item is uh, the third item is been brought to you uh, for to give you some public um, feedback on the first day of school. So we want to start off by letting you know that the first day went smoothly with minor exceptions. All positions were staffed and on board for the first day of school. On day one, bus routes went relatively smoothly and every child was home by 5 p.m. <clears throat> Our secondary schools dealt with cut the customary schedule change requests and schedule conflict issues, and most of those conflicts were resolved by Thursday afternoon. The superintendent commended our maintenance crews at the school level and district level on the great condition of our facilities. Ms. Blackburn visited nine schools the first week, and she reported that each one was in top condition. The leadership team and our curriculum supervisors also visit many of our schools this, this year and provided support as needed, especially on the first day. 
I personally visited 10 schools last week, and I also have the same uh, response that Ms. Blackburn had. They were looking very well. So we are ready to start this year and have a great year <clears throat> with a continued focus on engagement with our students and families. So that's our report on the first day. Uh, the next item. I want um, to make a comment. Yes, on sir. That, if I may. I, I, start, I went to bus stops in my neighborhood in the morning to see the little kids go off. Many of them were first year kids. And I went back in the afternoon to see how their first day went. And, and I want you to take this back to your, your t teachers and principals. I've never seen so many happy kids. And this is the first year that I just saw everybody was happy. They were excited, they were happy, they loved their school, they enjoyed their teachers, and across the board, this is what I saw. And I think that's commendable. And I hope you would take that back to your folks and let them know that at least in my district, the bus stops I visited, everybody was really excited and pleased, and the kids were beside themselves, and continue to be today. Thank you, sir. Item four, uh, math coaches, Jonathan Schultz, the supervisor for <clears throat> math, uh, will provide a brief overview of instructional coaching in secondary mathematics. Good evening, board members. Um, just as a uh, quick background, uh, last year you received information on what our instructional coaching model looks like at the elementary level. Um, tonight is a chance to update you and give, give you some background on what, uh, how things work at the secondary level, which focuses on mathematics. Um, in general, our, um, everything that we, we do, you've, you've seen the picture uh, many times, so everything we're trying to do is guided by our, our instructional model and trying to put, um, you know, put the best practices in our classrooms, help our teachers deliver the best instruction so our students are the most successful that they can be. Our um, recently adopted six-year plan has a, um, you know, a, some, some great pieces in it in terms of our goals for student achievement, but also in terms of the level of instruction that we want to have in our um, divisions that we are delivering the highest quality instruction that we can. So um, we want our teachers using best practices and 21st, uh, 21st century tools and we, in order for us to do that, we've got to help them. Uh, it's a lot of work to, to, to change and to, to, to grow as the profession changes and the demands um, that teachers face now in, in terms of time and, and just all the layers of, of, um, of you know, additional work that come with teaching now. Um, and trying to put that system into place, one of the key ways that we're working to do that in the county is through our coaching model. So just as a quick reminder, uh, at the elementary level, we have five instructional coaches supporting our schools, uh, and they, they work with um, supporting teachers in both reading and math. At the secondary level, we have six uh, supporting mathematics. The primary responsibilities of the coaches um, are, are basically to help teachers get through the day and make things, uh, just, just make it possible to do their job the best that they can. They work with teachers in uh, co-planning and co-teaching lessons, uh, modeling lessons. They help teachers with uh, assessment of, of student learning, analyzing data, especially from benchmarks and SOL tests, and helping teachers stay on top of uh, students who uh, may be struggling for any reason and just trying to monitor student, help them monitor student progress. Uh, they also, when we work to um, have a division level initiative um, to try to get everybody moving in the same direction, all the instruction moving in the same direction across the county, the uh, coaches play a big role in that. Their primary job is to work with teachers and they are professional developers. They're on the spot, ongoing, um, you know, uh, professional development support people for teachers. So uh, with that said, tonight I have the pleasure of int introducing a team of uh, folks from Christiansburg High School um, who are going to share their experiences about working together last year in, in that coaching situation. So we have uh, Dr. Kevin Sears, a uh, principal. Uh, we have Ernestine Seville, who's our math coach at Christiansburg High School, and Amy Price, who's a, a mathematics teacher at Christiansburg High School. Good evening, Dr. Staten and members of the board. First, I would like to thank you for approving that uh, math coaches be employed at the high school level. I think uh, the position contributed greatly to the growth we saw last year in math scores on SOL tests, and more importantly, the number of students who were passing math classes. I don't know how familiar you are with the data at Christiansburg, but we had a uh, 
a very large ninth grade bubble. About 25% of our ninth graders were being retained every year. Math and English were the two biggest reasons that those retentions were happening. And last year, we had a 94% promotion rate with our ninth graders, and the math coach played a large part in that. And as for CHS, Ms. Seville Brock, uh, she was invaluable in a number of ways. First, she worked with our teachers to implement strategies that were taught through the professional development program. She helped them take these strategies and plan lessons that incorporated the strategies that increased student engagement and created classrooms where learning was more active and there was less stand and deliver going on. Um, she helped teachers sort through and make useful uh, meaning of the feedback and suggestions that were, pro uh, that were given during the team observations. And if you're not familiar with that process, last year we had uh, data sweeps going on where teams went through the school and, and uh, observed uh, every teacher in the building. Then we also did uh, team observations where uh, two or more people would go in and observe a specific teacher and provide written feedback. And Ms. Seville Brock, the math coach, was able to take that with each math teacher and say, okay, this is what they meant. These, you know, we, this really fits well with your style, uh, this suggestion, suggestion, so let's take it and run with it, and I'll help you plan it, and I'll help you pull the resources to make that happen. Uh, what, from my perspective, one of the most beneficial parts was of having uh, the math coach at the high school level was that she was able to coordinate the math remediation programs for students who still needed a verified credit in math to graduate. And uh, keep in mind, those are students who may have taken the math class two or three years ago but failed the SOL. She worked with teachers to get them out of non-SOL classes or after school or before school, during lunch, whenever they could be remediated. Ms. Seville Brock set that schedule up and got them in and got them the extra help and, and more than doubled the percentage of students last year who were passing the retakes. And, and I'm very proud to say that every single senior we had last year who still needed a math SOL eventually passed that math SOL and that was not a barrier for, uh, that kept them from graduating. And a large part of that was because of the work that was completed by the math coach. She also coordinated the uh, expedited retakes, the remediation for the expedited retakes, and those are students who don't pass the test but score a, a 375 or higher, and if we can get them to pass it before the end of the year, then their first score, the failing score, does not count against us with the state accountability standards, and we more than doubled our rate of uh, students who were passing the expedited retakes as well last year, and, and that w for, in math was a very large part because of the work uh, that was done by the math coach. She served as a liaison between the central office administrators, the school-based administrators, and the math teachers, and she was able to facilitate better communication because sometimes we don't always know what the other group is talking about. They'll send something out and we're so busy when we read the email or, or get the message, we say okay, and we try to run with it, but having her in place, she was able to, to look at it more in more detail and get back with us and say, okay, let's try this, let's, uh, let's go this route to see if we can be successful with our students. And uh, finally, she was able to report specific progress that each teacher had made throughout the year, things that we may not have seen just going in the classroom to do the observations. She uh, was more in touch with uh, the student progress. You know, yes, he, he only got a 64, but at the midterm of the first uh, nine weeks, he was at a 32, and we were able to see that much growth in him in that amount of time. So it was, she just gave us a lot of valuable information. It was an incredible resource to have. And I truly believe that Montgomery County uh, saw more growth than probably any other county in the area last year with secondary math. And the biggest reason why was because we uh, had the foresight to hire math coaches and put them in the high school, high, in the high schools. And uh, as a result, we just saw some tremendous growth across the board. Thank you. <clears throat> Good evening. My name is Ernestine Seville, and I am the math coach at Christiansburg High School. Thank you for the opportunity for me to come and to present to you some exciting things that happen at CHS. I would like to talk just a little bit about one of the programs and a team of teachers that I supported last year. Working with Dr. Schultz, the administrators at Christiansburg Middle, Christiansburg High School, and the coach at Christiansburg Middle, we were able to identify approximately 64 students that were gonna need targeted intervention prior to taking Algebra One. We collected data points on each one of these students. 
We looked at previous grades. We looked at benchmark tests. <laughs> we looked at SOL scores. Out of those 60 plus students, we noticed that only three of them had passed the eighth grade math SOL. So we planned instruction based upon their needs, their gaps in the math content and in their math skills. We tracked their progress. We tracked their progress in intervention programs such as Math 180 and Reflex Math. Reflex Math is a computational fluency program that's all online. We tracked their progress in the SMI, which is the Scholastic Math Inventory, and also in common assessments. We created a data wall, and in the PowerPoint, you can see just a snippet of our data wall. Each index card represented a student, one of those 64 students. We charted their progress. We wanted to know how well are you doing in Math 180. I was able to look at their progress in these programs and then highlight the teachers, those classroom teachers. Oh, by the way, this student might need some more time on reflex or this student may need some one-on-one -on -one in Math 180 to get to the next module. But we were also able to look at those data cards and celebrate some success when we had students that, for the first <clears throat> time, had 80% mastery of their multiplication facts. We were able to celebrate that by looking at our data wall and identifying those students. The team of teachers, along with myself, were able to tailor that instruction to meet the needs of our students. <clears throat> every day, every student received direct instruction, small group instruction, and online instruction. I tried to support the teachers by sharing with them best practices in mathematics, sharing with them engagement strategies, engagement activities, so they could do what they do best, which is teach. With a focus on the data, we determined that some of these students were going to be ready for Algebra 1 by mid-year. So as you can see on this next slide, 76% of those 60-plus students were ready for Algebra 1 by second semester through co-planning targeted instruction, research-based interventions, and common assessments, our students were better prepared to perform in Algebra 1 and on the SOL. Of these students placed in Algebra 1 mid-year, 88% of them scored proficient on the Algebra 1 SOL. Remember, these are the same students that only three of them scored proficient in eighth grade math SOL. We collected data. We used the data to inform the instruction. We created common assessments. We <coughs> analyzed the results, and we saw student success. Not only academic success, but we saw students, for the first time, feeling confident about mathematics, having someone in the building that they had, had a relationship with within, with that teacher. They knew they had someone they could go to. So not only academic success, but self-confidence, good attitudes about mathematics. And we had students for the first time realizing they could do mathematics and they could be successful. Now I'd like to introduce to you one of our outstanding math teachers at Christiansburg High School that I have a privilege, that I am privileged to work with. When you see the data on these uh, circle graphs, one thing it's not showing, she was one of the teachers that worked with these students. But one thing that's not showing here that I want you to know, 100% of her students that are represented in these circles scored proficient on the Algebra 1 SOL. Here's Amy Price. 
Um, first off, thank you for letting me have this time tonight. My name is Amy Price. I am a math teacher at Christiansburg High School. I'm currently in my 15th year of teaching at Christiansburg High School. I actually did my student teaching and things all in Montgomery County. So I've seen lots of changes throughout the years with Montgomery County. Um, a couple years ago, Jonathan Schultz contacted me to let me know that we were at Christiansburg High School. We were getting a part-time um, math coach. And having that part-time person did make some differences in our building. We were able to accomplish some things that we had never been able to accomplish before in those years. However, a part-time person just really and truly was not enough. So the following year, which was this past year, Jonathan contacted me again and said that Ernestine Sevilbrock was going to be joining us as a full-time math coach. I was pretty excited but you know, a little hesitant because I was like, okay, is this just another change? Is it gonna last? What's gonna happen? Um, I was very pleased when Ernestine came in. She immediately tried to develop relationships with both teachers, students, administrators, all the way across the board. Um, it showed that she was really wanting to do better, wanting to make a difference. Um, as a teacher, I find myself not having a lot of time. Um, I have a planning block but I don't have time still to get everything accomplished. Uh, she, along with our administrative team and our guidance staff, was able to go down to the middle school and work with those guidance counselors, those teachers, to look at data and say, these kids need to be in this class, and then they were placed correctly. So that was the first major change for me, was when I walked in the first day of class, I knew that the kids were in the right classroom, which makes a tremendous difference. Then the second thing that was really important to me was, in the past, I may not have a planning block with anyone who could really help me. You know, if I was stuck on how to come across a topic, and you know, I tried everything I knew, and I was like, okay, now what do I do? The kids still aren't getting it. There oftentimes was not anyone to compare notes with. So we wound up having co-planning, um, I had teachers that also taught the same subject as I did at the same time as I did. And it was oftentimes, most of the time, Ernestine Seville was right there along with us to say, hey, here's another option. Have you thought about this? Try this. You know, that helps tremendously <clears throat> because then we can go back into the classroom and have a different aspect on it that you wouldn't imagine the difference. Um, with the part-time person, the first year, that person might be there during my planning block they might not be so you know full time is really a key there um, along with that in the classroom Ernestine and I would go in together some days some days Ernestine would go in and I'd come in a few minutes later or you know other way is around but Ernestine was there to support those kids um, she could come in the kids often had you know they knew who she was they knew they could trust in her as they did their classroom teacher my average class is about 20 to 25. Often, you know, students who have not been successful, they're not the most motivated. One person with 25 students, 15 of them being students who have never been successful before, you can't do it by yourself some days. Um, Ernestine came in, she would just randomly show up, and she would be there to help those students. Oftentimes, these are the students who can't stay after school. I can't pull them from you know, another class because during my planning block, they have English. So they felt more successful with those type of things. Um, she helped me track data. You know, that's a big piece is knowing what a student knows, what they don't know, and where to go from there. So as she was showing you the wall, that wall was in our math office. And we would look at it together and say, this is what a kid knows, this is what a kid doesn't know, and this is where we need to go from there, and how can I help you, and what can we do to fix this? As she was saying, I had one student who had passed the math eight SOL in my class, one out of 12. That was a small class, granted, but one out of 12 had passed, and I had a 100% pass rate. Those kids were ecstatic. You know, they had the feeling of, I have been successful for the first time ever in math, and now those kids, I see them in the hallway, and they're, they're in geometry now, and they're very proud of themselves, and they're telling their teacher, I can do this, I've done it in the past. 
whereas I've passed many students, many students have passed my class, and they did not pass the SOL. So they went on to geometry, but the likelihood of them being successful there is slim because they don't have the confidence. So I ask you to just keep this, these things in mind. Um, we, we have come a long way. If you look at the percentages, as Dr. Sears said, we have come a long way. Christiansburg High School has made tremendous strides. However, we still have a little ways to go. So I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. In summary, I just wanted to remind you, um, Jonathan and I about this time last year were before you telling you um, a long list of math enhancements and resources that we were going to try to provide to teachers that you all were gracious enough to include in the budget. Um, and I think we were all a little nervous about how that would play out. Sometimes it's really difficult to take things from resources and professional development to actually making change in the classroom. Um, and I'm very proud the team before you represents all the teams at the high school. This exact model is what happened in each of our high schools between the teachers and the coach and the administrator in central office. We really were a team um, to put all of our resources together to meet the needs of our students. Um, and so I just wanted to remind you that um, in a few weeks we'll be sharing with you an update on all of those pieces. Um, but the instructional coaches really were a vital part of that. Um, they really were, I, I think, probably had one of the most difficult jobs um, because as Dr. Shears mentioned, Ernestine had to translate what she was hearing from Jonathan, from Kevin, from the teachers, and make sure that all of us were hearing what was going well and what needed improvement at all of those levels. Um, and she really was the linchpin and the other instructional coaches to make sure that all of us were operating on the same page. We were being responsive to teachers' needs um, to make sure that we could be successful to meet the needs of our students. Um, so again, I'm so proud of this team and, and all the other teams that they represent. And would just like to thank you again for investing um, in the math enhancements and especially the math coaches. We really appreciate it and saw some wonderful results for our students. Board members, you have questions? Could, just could like we to... find out where the other five are located for the secondary um, schools? They're at um, Eastern Montgomery High School, Shawsville Middle, Christiansburg Middle, Auburn High School, and Auburn Middle. Okay. I'd just like to comment. I remember the presentation from last year, and uh, especially, you know, I've been really keen on that relationship piece, and it sounds like this is exactly what has happened. And I'm ready to go home tonight because I'm happy. This is, you know, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, thank you all for the hard work and just appreciate your dedication to these students. Really appreciate it. Thank you. And did, did Ms. Price say you had 12 people in your algebra class? That's quite a nice ratio. <laughs> up here. I have a couple questions um, on the slides, if I could, please. Um, the one, the role of the coach, uh, those three bullets there, what percentage do you? they spend in each one yeah. if you were to assign a percentage anybody have an idea sorry but I do have questions Being my first year at Christiansburg High School, I would say that the large percentage of it was with co-planning. Um, we had some division-wide uh, uh, professional development, especially with engagement strategies, how to get students engaged in the mathematics, not just sitting in the class being compliant. So a lot of the uh, percentage of the time was in co-planning with them. Um, we did have to look at uh, assessment, the benchmark scores, pulling all of that data out, looking at what is it our students need to be successful, um, and then supporting those initiatives and the interventions. On any given week, you know, it may be 33, 33, 33%, and on another week, it may be um, the first one, almost 100%. It really depends upon the needs of the teachers. Okay. When you say co-planning, are you including co-teaching? Yes, on some with it. Yes, uh, we we'll do a model of where there's some co-teaching. There will be times when um, I will plan with the teacher, 
and then they'll want me just to come into the classroom and observe to give them feedback sometimes they will want me okay you take this part or and I'll take this part of it or you work with this group I'll work with that group um, we've even had one teacher that wasn't real she felt that she wasn't real strong in one area of the mathematics that was new to her and so I went in and modeled the instruction for that so yeah co-teaching is just that in the classroom with the teachers and they're teaching I'm teaching sometimes I'm teaching they're observing they're teaching I'm observing the, the um, second slide which is the pie yes no the second slide in the both presentation for the instructional model yeah. mm -hmm. uh, the, this. right yeah. there yes if you look at one of the pieces of pie is engagement and personally I think that engagement should be overlapping everything but studies are showing that co-teaching and engagement is becoming incredibly successful is that the combination you're using um, or are you one teacher teaching the other observing how, how tell me about how engagement fits into this it, it it would be a, kind of a blending of both the engagement is you want you want the students engaged with the mathematics you want the students doing the mathematics so in that model of co-planning and co-teaching with those individual student uh, individual teachers it depends upon the teacher sometimes sometimes there will be a new strategy that a teacher wants to use that is one that's considered best practices in mathematics under that engagement strategy so they just need an extra pair of hands because maybe students are going to different stations and so you may have five different stations and you have students rotating among those five stations and so having another adult another teacher a math teacher in that room can help facilitate Engaging the students them, yeah. sure. going through those stations and getting what they need the important piece out of that station thank you a question about uh, as the students in front of technology how often are they in front of a computer doing math 180 or the different things per week in the model that we used last year um, our students in the math 180 algebra readiness that went into algebra one they were on a computer every day at least 45 minutes every day uh, mrs. price's algebra ready and algebra one classes um, it's second week of school and they're already on technology we have unfortunately we don't have the technology that I wish we had but um, we do have some laptops that they're able to access and uh, so they're using the technology of those laptops getting on the reflex the math 180 also those programs students can access those at home through internet so the 45 minutes is an addition to their classroom time or yes okay. yes I have one final question if you'll go down to the I think it's two slides yeah that one so we have six instructional coaches at the secondary level and five at the elementary level how do you interact in other words I'm I'm sure you're seeing trends and information at the secondary level that you should be communicating down to the to the elementary level to try to you know head it off at the pass so to speak so that they are going to be more successful as they move forward yes sir we have a um, the, we have a division um, what we call them we have a literacy team that dr. Graham helps run from the reading side that's got a vertical alignment right. and then we have a math literacy team as well that has representation from the, the coaches so um, it's a little little less than once a month we're, we're getting together to, to look at what's happening vertically there um, so as Ernestine mentioned when we talked about um, helping that transition between the middle and the high school there was um, extensive um, 
coordination across the middle, across all of them, because we, we sent folks to support, we, we spread them out to support BMS and uh, BHS as well during the, the placement part as we tried to work on trying to help get kids in the right classes. Um, there was extensive collaboration um, across the, you know, uh, you know, all the middle school folks working together, all the high school folks working together, but then also um, across middle, middle and high in the feeder schools. Um, so that was one of, the, one of the pieces where we were looking at the data uh, vertically trying to coordinate that. So the expect, is it a fair expectation after a period of time that as you communicate and develop strategies at the elementary level that you would see less and less issues <coughs> going to move, transition into high school and middle school and high school as you start well, to collaborate well, and? Yes, I mean, yeah, the, yes sir, that would be the hope. The, the, the issue really comes down to the fact that when we had the reset on the, on the SOL tests, um, the high school kids faced bigger changes okay. than, than some of the other grade levels. So things that didn't appear to be problems in the past were now showing up. Okay. All right. Thank you. Board members, any other questions? Okay. okay. Thank you, Dr. Schultz, uh, Ms. Weaver, Dr. Sears, Ms. Seville, and Ms. Price. Uh, board members, this uh, was an information-only item and does not require action. Uh, the next item, um, end of year report and carryover funds request is an action item uh, and is presented for your approval. At the August 5th, 2014 board meeting, Ms. Blackburn provided you with a detailed proposal of how you could allocate carryover funds to meet the critical needs of the school division. I want to also remind you that Ms. Blackburn was, has renewed her recommendation to fund the Eat Backpack Initiative. Dr. Graham will discuss the e-backpack initiative in detail in a few minutes. The first two slides are a recap of Ms. Blackburn's uh, recommendations on how the carryover money could be spent. I want to also highlight that Ms. Blackburn has included as a change the cost to restore the Governor's, Schools summer, the Governor's summer School Program at a cost of $7,434, and is shown on the second slide. Now at this time, uh, to provide you with additional information on the EBAC initiative program, Dr. Graham will come forward to the podium. Thank you. As you may recall, Ms. Blackburn shared a recommendation at the last board meeting to consider using a portion of the carryover funds to support the e-backpack program. Since this is a one-time opportunity to provide a powerful resource, it is evident <coughs> in um, many states that have already implemented one-to-one -one initiatives and experienced powerful results. So I wanted to share a little bit of that with you. The state of Indiana, Indiana did a one-to-one -one uh, program and from that their results were increased student and teacher engagement, improved academic achievement, improved attendance, and students developed deeper cross-disciplinary knowledge and more in-depth 21st century skills. In Michigan, similar study, the results indicated that student engagement was at an all-time high, that attendance was up, that 21st skills development had increased, and that academic achievement as measured by standardized tests was on the rise. And in Maine, when they implemented a one-to-one -one computing statewide in their middle schools, they saw significant improvements in writing scores on the statewide test. They saw more um, extensively that students that used the laptops the, mo the most scored the best. And of the core content areas, some of the most substantial academic achievement results have been with writing skills throughout all those states. This year, we have an opportunity to have significant state support for the cost towards a one-to-one -to -one initiative. To take advantage of the state funding, we do need to act now. As you saw in the video and heard from Julie Kraft and Jennifer Weaver at the last board meeting, we know from our pilot that we saw a significant impact on students and on the teachers that were involved. We also know this is likely a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to develop a program 
with the state providing the largest portion of the funds. In this case, the state would provide $208,000 the first year, and over four years, the state would provide $800,000, actually over $800,000. So I'm going to show you three charts. And the last chart will be a summation of the whole picture. In this first chart, you see that the carryover budget recommendation, you will see that MCPS um, to match the grant would be $41,600. That match is based on providing a one-to-one -one initiative for three schools which qualify. That's Christiansburg High School, Auburn High School, and Eastern Montgomery High School. The additional associated cost would be $89,694. And those costs include teacher devices and mobile device management package. Making MCPS cost in one year $131,294. And then um, just below that, if the county included Blacksburg, we would incur the cost of devices of $191,750 plus the additional cost of $5,940, resulting in a total of $197,690. So can I stop there and ask a question? Certainly. So I add the two together and that's what my cost is gonna be in year one? If you include Blacksburg, yes. If you include Blacksburg, mm -hmm. and then I deduct the 208 from it, and that would be my final cost? Deduct if the 208. It says the state contribution each year is 208. Yeah, that's separate. I just put Montgomery County cost in the above. So the 208 is, you wouldn't deduct that. I'm sorry? You would not deduct that. That's separate. So the 131 is already the deduction costs? Correct. Okay. It's okay. All right. That's what I wanted to understand. Mm -hmm. So is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Okay. So really the decision the board is faced with at this time is, does the board support an e-backpack program? And if so, would you support the three eligible schools during the first year? And, or would you also support Blacksburg High School? Or would you want to wait and do Blacksburg at a later time? BHS could ultimately be added at any time since the state isn't giving any funding for BHS. This next slide takes you into the future years. In year two, for the three eligible schools, we must factor in the remaining $8,660 to, to be made up for the ITRT salary. Since that would be, the $8,660 would be from one-time carryover money this year. You see on the chart the cost for, three, for years three and four as well. The top chart shows the three schools, and if you wanted to add Blacksburg High School, the bottom chart shows the cost of Blacksburg High School. Each year, in, sub in subsequent years, sh you should opt to include BHS. So whichever year you opt, that's their cost. Note year three in the bottom chart, uh, based on our implementation experience and the addition of Blacksburg High School, we believe an additional technician might be needed in year three. That's so only what, if we, I'm sorry. Question, uh, if, if um, you didn't add Blacksburg to this, then you wouldn't need that technician? I think after year one, we would need to really evaluate and see the workload um, because we could find out that we do, but so, we put it in year three. So you're telling me that regardless, you're probably gonna need another technician we would evaluate at the end of the first year but sooner or later we were going to need another technician because of the quantity of devices that you would have and someone to service those devices but definitely you would need one by the third year that's what we think um, and uh, back on the other <coughs> side I put a little asterisk saying you might need them sooner okay. So if we participate for one year, we will touch the lives of about 500 students. Over four years, that would impact 2,000 students. While we know local, local funds are limited, this is an opportunity to obtain funding from the state and to provide a powerful program for students. 
It also provides a tool for teachers to allow teachers to find more engaging and real-time methods to reach every child. You just heard uh, them talk about using the computers daily. Imagine having one in your own hands every day. So in, this, in the age of technology, we need to prepare our students for college and the competitive job market. So on this last slide, it's just a at a glance slide so that you can look at everything on one slide. You'll see in year one, this is, these are the same numbers that you saw in the previous slides. 41,000 plus the additional cost of 89,000 something and a subtotal of 131,000. <clears> then that's just everything for the three schools is on the left side. And then if you add Blacksburg High School, that's on the right, school, right side. The first goal mentioned by the state is to improve student achievement and graduation dropout rates by providing the infrastructure to extend learning capabilities and create a personalized learning experience. In our short pilot, we saw the potential to do just that, to realize that goal. You could see in the first pilot the heightened engagement, which may especially benefit children who would not otherwise afford a device. This is an opportunity which we believe warrants serious consideration. So I'll stop and pause for any questions. I have a couple. Uh, the first one is, what is our absolute drop dead date to approach or to be included in this program as far as the state is concerned? We, ha we have the term of this year. We would need to start this year, um, but to ask the Board of Supervisors for money or to use the end of the year money, that's whenever the date is. Right, so we, there's no deadline that we have to, like, we don't have to say to the state by November 1st, we want to participate in this program. If we don't use the money this year, then we right. would lose that opportunity. Okay. I don't know that there's a date there's not a, there's not a date within the year. Okay, right. my second question is. I, I should add to that, though. You have to consider, you have to order the devices in order right. to be able to use them in the year. Right. You're going to have to plan. Right. Well, it, it, it's related to something I'm going to bring up in just a minute. That's why I asked the question. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing that I have, I noticed that every year the same amount is given to the, that the state is requiring us to give is the same as, a, as and the same amount that they're actually going to give is the same is there not any consideration for different student um, you know numbers of students for each year or is it that's just what the state is saying based upon this first year we're going to base the next four to be the exact same we use that first year number but you look at student enrollment when you're um, so, so the state would adjust and we would have to adjust our amount that we would need to that, give that is my understanding okay is that, is that correct yes okay all right yeah. so this the numbers here don't necessarily there's going to be some fluidity to them right okay what how many were in the uh, pilot program at auburn we did uh two total classes 50 or 90. do you remember it was two at auburn and two at right so, so about, about 100 about 90 to 100. 90, okay. That's what I thought. <clears throat> Talk to Carl Pauly about that. He said um, it was done, mm -hmm. and those kids had an experience that they would probably never forget the rest of their lives. So it's the type of program where if we do it this coming year, and all of a sudden the roof caves in somewhere and we have no money for the next year, regardless, it's still an experience that these youngsters will have that they'll never have again, possibly, or would probably never have the chance to have if we don't win this venture. That was exactly our thought. If we can offer it now and have the state give us $200,000. <clears> if, if we can go the second, the third, and fourth year, hallelujah. Mm -hmm. But if we don't jump on this wagon now, we got 500 kids plus who are gonna have a, right. miss a great opportunity. And to add to that, there is not a penalty if we after this year, we can't afford to keep going. Right. There's no penalty either. No. Well, the only, the, the only penalty is our kids will hurt because they won't have the second or third year. Correct. Right. I have a question, um, and this is just completely for information. I don't want anybody to gather anything from it. Um, with the new schools, Auburn and Blacksburg both, um, in the form of technology, by being a new facility, how many more computers in the classroom? I understand it's completely different than having a device in your hand. D 
does do those students have compared to the older high schools? I think Ms. Weaver just worked on the uh, FF&E budget. Do you, can you answer that? It's actually not drastically different because um, technology's worked really hard to supply them with mobile laptop carts and to continue to right, update those things. So it's um, student availability to technology is not drastically different. Teachers have more access to technology in the new buildings um, and everyone has access to the 21st century classroom. Um, so it's not drastically different. Okay, so like say per each classroom, how many is there like one cart available? I mean, as far as iPads or things like that. I mean, just when we were going on the tours, it just seemed like there were more. And that's kind of where I'm coming from, whether it be computer stations or iPad carts or, you know, whatever it might be. It just seemed there was more availability in the newer facilities than what I've seen in some of the older ones. I mean, I, I'm not going on smart boards. I'm going on personal mm -hmm. type you know, I think in the older buildings they have more computer labs and in the newer buildings they have more wireless um, right. labs so uh, that's different but in terms of sheer number of devices available for student use I don't think it's drastically different board members of the questions how expensive is the device we are talking about I know we are given $400 per student by state and then at one point we looked 699 per device. Now where are we? 650. So if um, the additional cost only covers the covers of the iPads and the teacher devices, so we are saying that. 280,000 plus 41,600 has to cover all the devices, physical devices. Is it what it is? The state gives 208. And then 20% of our part is 41.6. So that gives us 249.6 or 249,600. So is that the amount we're getting all devices for $650 piece? So you can see on this one the, um, the title. It, it is including covering additional costs of the device as well. Our match goes towards the additional, the difference between additional the devices. 650, not additional devices, the additional cost of the device, the difference between what the state's giving us and what we're going to pay for the devices we've selected. Additional devices is listed on there would mean, though, we have to add the teacher devices as well. Okay. And the management would include the insurance and everything that takes to keep these devices up? That's correct. Originally, when we did some of our first numbers, we calculated insurance separately, but the package they have picked includes the insurance. So that contributes to the higher price of the device. A couple of general comments. I mean, uh, and I think I've stated to this board, either via email or in other conversations, that I support it as long as we include Blacksburg High School, um, but I also believe that what we're doing if we vote this is that we're committing a long-term investment for the next four years. This is not something that we would just do for one year, so we're committing our budget. If you look at those numbers, we're already putting a lot of money in a budget that we don't know a whole lot about in the coming years. Mm -hmm. And if you read the paper recently, the governor said that there is a, what, a $400,000 shortfall in one year and another almost eight hundred thousand dollars shortfall coming no, that would be three hundred and forty seven million dollars for next year and five hundred and thirty six million the following year for the state budget from the state budget and what we're doing is we're committing about one point one million dollars almost one point two million dollars right here in front of us um, you know it's a, it's a difficult decision for me when we're looking at how we struggled in the previous years with budget. I'm, I'm all for technology, I'm all for this. Um, and, and we definitely don't want to 
look away from a $208,000 that the state's going to give us, but it's uh, <clears throat> this is a lot of money that we're putting up front without any knowledge and we have to commit to it. I think if we vote on it and we go forward with it and it's it's part of our budget and it doesn't come out for the next four years and it could go up, as Mr. Lyons pointed out, there's some fluidity here and unfortunately I think that is that number is going to fluid up. <laughs> it's not gonna fluid down. We've got two great new high schools and other great high schools and people will move to our county. Mm -hmm. yeah. Another item that we need to remember is that we committed to continue to improve our salary compensation. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that in year two, it's a cost of $2.04 million. Right. Well, we're not making a four-year commitment. We're making a one-year commitment. We're looking at this year right now. But and and we've, I think we've stated over and over again, if, if we can do it for this one year, there's gonna be 500 students who will have incredible experiences. If we can do it next year, that would be great, but there's no commitment that says that we can do it next year. I think we need to take this thing one year at a time and let's hope for the best once we get through this year. If we, if we look at this as a four-year commitment and say we can't do it because it's a four-year commitment, we're making a big mistake. We're making just, a horrendous just, mistake. We're gonna disagree on that, okay. Um, just because I think it's a long-term thing. You don't just go in and pull the plug on something like this after you can't you can't fund it after. I would year. hope you we wouldn't. You know. Well, we don't have any guarantees. That's what I'm reason I'm bringing this up. We can guarantee one year. And I, I don't agree. I think if we need to guarantee at least if we're going to do this that we're doing in it for the full ride of four years, because that's how the whole thing's going to be affected. But for me, it's also not fair for the three schools that can get the grant right. to suffer just because we might not can afford to add the fourth one, even though, yes, I think fair across the board is great, but we do pilot programs in each different school all the time, and not all students get to, get to do those things. And that's, you know, a little bit, I, in my thoughts, the first year, let's try to see how it goes before we initial the extra 200,000. You know, like I said, that's not the great way to look at things, but why make three schools of students not be able to engage in something like this because of lack of funding? Well, why do the same thing at Blacksburg because of lack of funding? I mean, there's students there too, I, and they have the same needs. And we've made lots of sacrifices for Blacksburg as well that the other schools have not gotten. As far as that goes. Well, I'm not trying to pit it. Many, schools many against, sacrifices. Not pit, pitting the schools against each other. I'm saying it's, I'm it's all either. in. I'm just saying. It's all in. But, like I said, when you have to look at this openly, you have to look at it openly. I am. Can we, the, the only reason that this is even available to us is because of three schools. Right. Three schools, and if we're... If we're trying to focus our district on the data and how we're moving and well, how we're not moving, it's those three schools that need the movement. You know, I do understand that there are students at Blacksburg High School who need the same kind of support and the same kind of opportunity. And it would be very hard for me to say, no, we can't include <coughs> Blacksburg. You know, Joe, one of the few times you and I are gonna agree is that this is a one-year commitment. We do not have to move forward with this for any more than one year at this point. And even if we include Blacksburg at this point, we can still say we can't do Blacksburg for the next year. We can, we can still do the three schools who we're gonna get the matching funds or not the matching funds, but gonna get resources to help support the program. But after listening to those students uh, two weeks ago or whenever they came and, and uh, spoke with us, well, wait, I take that back. It was the video that we saw of them. Um, how can we not you know, give that opportunity for these children to be successful? I mean, it's just, it was just amazing to me how <clears throat> engaged they were. And listening to our teachers tonight talk about the key point is to get those students engaged, and that's how we move things forward and, and 
be able to make sure that they're ready for the world when they leave Montgomery County Public Schools. I can't say no to this um, opportunity. I don't know where I'm at right this minute as far as Blacksburg for this year because we have said we've made a commitment to our teachers as far as compensation, or our employees as far as compensation, and we need to stick to that. But I've been around long enough to understand we've made commitments to a lot of things, and unfortunately the funds are not there to be able to do them when we'd like to do them. But this is a huge opportunity. Ms. Franklin, we must have the same sheet of music. For once <sighs> we do. I am in full agreement. I think we, the reason that I will support Blacksburg this year is because the money's available to support Blacksburg this year. Next year, and I, think, and I think you're absolutely right, there's three schools that have brought this to our attention. We need to focus on those three schools. This year, we're fortunate. We can focus on a four school. Next year, again, we'll focus on the three schools and see what happens. And I think that this opportunity is one we cannot let slide by. This is brought before us for action. So there's other things in the carryover budget that we need to look at. I'm going to, um, you have a, a summary sheet there in front of you. I don't know if you can bring that up or not, the summary sheet. Slide that one includes two. everything in the carryover. Yeah. I think it's yeah, I think we, they gave it to us. Yeah. You gave a hard copy mm -hmm. there? Okay. Yeah, the, we do have a hard copy. I'm, I don't pay attention to the paper. I'm looking at mine. <laughs> I pay it. One thing that paper. we may want to consider, you know, with this carryover, making this an action, I may, I'm not saying I'm doing this right now, but we may consider making a motion of tabling this for the reason of we don't know if the Board of Supervisors is going to approve the other uh, 500 plus thousand dollars that we've requested because knowing whether or not we're actually going to get that would have a bearing on what I actually think we should spend the carryover funds on. Well, the only problem with that is in the process of this, they, we have to present it to them. Mm -hmm. And either they're going to vote on it and reject it or they're going to um, vote on it and carry it forward. Let me add a little bit more information. I don't, I wouldn't, I don't know if this is uh, definitive or not, but there is some grumblings that's coming over from the um, other side that uh, they may be willing to, um, to match funds um, that, uh, because we put forward um, 575 additional requests, mm -hmm. as you realize. Um, we don't know for certain whether or not that's going to um, go through, but one, one of some of the grumblings that's coming back is that they would be looking for this board uh, to match those monies and to make them available. Well, again, that's what I'm saying. I mean, we're, we're basing this upon, you know, this carryover that we have is a total of about $1.7 million, and we're, we're making these assumptions that we're going to use $575,000 of that to match the 575 that we've that we're requesting in addition to that my my problem with that is if we if they were to say we're not going to get the $575,000 we've requested in addition it would change how I think we should spend the 1.7 I had the initial my initial reaction to first sell this and discussed it with the superintendent is the 575 doesn't belong here because it's capital. And I think the two should be separate and we'll be talking about them in separate conversations. I've always said that. Um, she left it in here because basically, in, in my experience has been that uh, we should go ahead and vote on something because as Dr. Staten has said, we've got to submit this to the Board of Supervisors for their approval. So tabling it just delays the process and delays their action because they're honestly sitting there waiting on us to to come to them and say, okay, here's how we're gonna spend our carryover money. And if they come back to us and say, you know, they don't, they have in the past, in some instances, looked at it line by line, but they don't scrutinize it necessarily line by line. Um, they'll see what we have here, ask questions, and they'll vote on it as a package. Um, it seems like those two things are two separate actions though, correct? the 575 that we've requested and this? No, it'll be rolled into the carryover as she's got it stated here. 
Now, they may come back and say as a, as a separate action, they're going to give us an additional, as Dr. Staten has said, an additional 575, and yeah, that would be a separate vote. That's what I'm talking about. That, that's what we approved the request for a few weeks ago was that additional money, and they, they were not able to vote on it before this meeting. So, again, if we're presenting this to them and this is the way we're going to spend this money, um, I'm, I would be voting on that assuming that we're still going to get that other money. Otherwise, if, we, if there was a, an, a chance that we're not going to get it, I would change maybe what, we would, what we're presenting right here. That's my struggle with it. Okay. Because I do think that we do need that money. Like we've, we've, we're kind of setting that 575 that we've requested in addition to this, the 575 we've included in that to get us about $1.2 million for capital expenditures. My, my uh, stance on that would be I think we do need about that amount of money for capital ex expended expenditures. And so if they're not going to give us that additional, then I would say we need to funnel a little bit more than $575,000 out of this to capital expenses. That's where I'm, that's why I'm struggling with saying I would vote That would be your approach. Whole, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That doesn't necessarily mean it's everybody's approach. Yeah. Okay. And I, I'm not in favor of tabling it. I think we need to do, do vote on something and give it to them so that they have it and they can look at it um, and, and move forward with it and we can come back. We can always come we back and massage back. And, and massage the number. we don't get it. Right. So. Now, wait a minute. If we say we can come back if we don't get it and tweak things, uh, we have been in the position before where we put something forward to them and said, this is what we're going to use the money for. And then the money didn't get used the way it was stated when it was put before them. And it caused a problem. Mm -hmm. So we need to be sure what we're doing here. So if they say, here's we can't give you the whole 575 but we'll give you half of it you know then we have to we're still going to say we're still going to keep our 575 there we're still going to do everything else that we said we're going to do we just won't have that extra money to make the 1.2 or whatever it comes out to right, I mean, I, i'm just very leery of us saying well if they don't give us all the money we'll come back and tweak everything else <clears throat> Which is what I, we did with that when that occurred. I agree. Okay. Let we, me we, let me put this on the table. I want to make a motion that we use the um, the carryover funds as proposed. By the superintendent. Yeah, by the superintendent. Okay. That way the discussion can continue. And Mr. Ivers has made a motion to to use the carryover funds as recommended by the superintendent in the proposal before us. Second for the sake of discussion. And we have a second for discussion. So now we're in discussion. Thank you, Mr. Ivers. And I, I definitely agree with what happened a couple years ago with that money issue. And I was meaning more in the sense if it were voted down and we didn't get any of it and we knew we wouldn't get the money. It's not like we're spending it somewhere else. We're having to rethink the money we have. So any further discussion on the budget that the superintendent has recommended to us? Mm -hmm. I'll just say, I've, I, you know, if you all recall, I voted no to the budget that was put out, our entire budget, because I didn't believe that we had enough information to make the decisions that we needed to make around budget. Right. But with this, we're putting money back in, so I'm ready to vote yes. All right, I'm going to do roll call, please, if there's no further discussion. Ms. Bond? Yes. Ms. Franklin? Yes. Mr. Ivers? Yes. Ms. Coran? No. Mr. Lyons? No. Ms. Woolsey? No. Mr. Jones? Uh, this does include Blacksburg for one year, so I'm going to vote yes, since it does include Blacksburg for the one year. It does um, include Blacksburg. I'd like to. I'd like to double check that if that's okay, Mr. Jones. I'm going to walk up here. Is that it okay? Yeah. Include. Okay. Does it? I don't think it includes. No. Yeah, please, it says right please here. Please excuse me, Doctor Staten, and let me know. Backpack. Yeah, she uh, she put it in at, as an option if um, you wanted to 
included. And I think in your discussion, that's what you said you were going to do. So, Mr. Ivers, that was your motion? Yes, definitely. And Ms. Bond, you confirm that as your second? Yes. Thank you. It was under the 272-961 is the way I understood it. And with that, we have an approved use of carryover funds. That's listed as options is how I read it. I don't see that it specifically says that at the 272, but. 272. You, know what you said, Brenda. You can't hear me. With Mr. Jones's vote, we have an approved use of the carryover funds. Okay, thank you. And based on what I heard this board's discussion is, is that we would give the superintendent direction to, that those options would be for the Blacksburg okay. backpack. That's how I would interpret that. Correct me if I'm wrong in my interpretation. Well, I'm going to have to say, with that motion that was made, I don't know that that was clear that Blacksburg was being included in that. Um, just for clarity, I don't know that we need. You know, we voted on it, but I'm just saying for clarity. The, the motion that I put proposed, that I had put forward was her proposal and I had stated before because there's money for Blacksburg this year we're including it so but that option also the the bus replacement may be needed or maintenance needed or I mean restore right. supply budget so well, we are saying that we're not doing any of those well, no, we are. and 272 out of 272, we need how much of it for Blacksburg High School? 197,690. So there's not going to be much to cover the other options on that uh, option budget. I'm just putting it out. Sure, there is. The, no. Where's the right sheet right here? We'll seek clarity on that and provide the board with clarity on it. No, no, no. I think we need to make sure we're clear on what just happened here before we before we leave. So the way I understand what was put in front of us was that everything, all the capital projects, would be covered yes. with the five hundred seventy-five thousand, yes. and that if the supervisors wanted to give us the 575,000 more that it would be added to this so all those things would be covered even if the supervisors didn't give us any money we would still cover those capital projects that's the way is I that what your it. concern was well i think the subtotal section the options confuse me because that options where the blacksburg included dr graham has can other you help us with things this? would the in it. board feel more comfortable if there was a second motion clarifying the optional let, let, let expenditure let me, let me. and i'm, I'm going to ask katie miano to help me but the subtotal section you would take the blacksburg learning backpack as mr jones has suggested from that subtotal and then any extra money could be used for the options in that group and you did the subtraction didn't you Look on your sheet. Yeah, I'm not having a problem with it. No, right. They also put the bus replacement and some additional capital management projects in that with the Blacksburg. Were you going to? If you take the 197,690 that shows up in the year one for here for BHS. If you take that out of the 272, 961, 66, mm -hmm. it leaves you with 75, 271, 66. That can be allocated for, for the, the others, for, for the other, other options. Yep. options. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes. Which would be additional buses as far as more than the two buses that the 575. Yeah would be covering, right? right. Okay, that's right. what I thought. So the motion is okay and clear. Everybody's okay. Yep. I don't know how clear it was, but it was <laughs> voted on. 
Are we more comfortable with the explanation today? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I knew what I was voting on. Okay. <laughs> okay. Right. I mean, I knew it too. But. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, the next item is on the revised budget um, fiscal year 2014-15. Uh, the revised budget for 2014-15 is presented as an action item uh, for your pro approval. The total net change for the Montgomery County Public Schools is a decrease of $66,107 in state revenue and a reduction in the required expenditures for the uh, v VRS group life insurance and VRS retiree health care credit of $120,240. $7. The net change is in the decreases in revenue and required expenditures is $55,140. I move that we um, approve the revised budget fiscal year 2014-2015. Need a second? Second. Have a second. Any discussion on the revised operating budget as presented? Uh, I do just want to say I, I, my intention is to vote no again, uh, really based upon principle about how we arrive at the original budget. But I do want to commend um, Ms. Blackburn and the, uh, the rest of the staff for actually including, especially on this report as we're doing it, the thing that I really wanted, which was the major category expenditure summary that I uh, was a part of my original uh, reason for not voting for the budget. I'm glad that it's that part has been changed, um, but overall, because of the way we arrived at the original budget, and we're just really you know, making some adjustments. I do intend to vote no. Any further comments or questions? Again, since this is budget, I'll ask for roll call. Ms. Bond, yes. Ms. Franklin, no, for the same reasons as before. Mr. Ivers, yes. Ms. Coran, yes. Mr. Lyons, no. Ms. Woolsey? Yes. Mr. Jen? Yes. Revised budget has been approved. Okay, the next item is uh, the facilities update. Dan Baranon, Director of Facilities, will provide you with the facilities update. Good evening. We've done a whole lot of things this summer. We still have a lot of work to do in a lot of areas, but we did get a lot done in a short time uh, with everybody's help. Uh, the two roof projects, uh, the center section of Market Beaks and the annex section of Christiansburg Elementary were successfully re-roofed just in time for school to open. Uh, large projects uh, executed, I think, very well. Uh, we've made some project progress on the Christiansburg Area Feasibility Study. We're working on that diligently. It's very important. It's very complex. And I know Ms. Black's Blackburn is keeping you informed on that. Yeah. Shawsville Middle School yeah. Annex Demolition. Uh, it's going uh, at the beginning of the summer, right after the 4th of July. Uh, celebration in Shawsville, uh, the people removing the asbestos containing material and other hazardous materials came in, uh, completed that, and then uh, right before school started, we were able to begin the demolition pro process. I was there uh, with Principal Dickinson on the first day of school, and work was going on across the street. It was not a lot of noise, amazingly. Uh, you know, things were coming down and students were learning and teachers were teaching. So that seems to be going well. It's well managed and everything is contained and safe. That should be another couple weeks before the total building is down to the foundation and the slab. Then about a month after that, the, the things underneath the slab and everything else will be removed. And then the site turned to a green, a green site. Uh, 
Christianburg High School gym entrance doors. Uh, we had a little hiccup at the beginning of those in one area, the doors that go into the commons. Uh, we found a problem with a missing lintel uh, in the doorway. We had to go back to the engineers and get a lintel designed and put in a uh, small change order made. And they got started in earnest finally uh, this week and they're working late, and we hope in the next couple of weeks those doors will be finished. All the doors were there, they were ready to begin, and we had that hiccup, but they're moving along. That will be a big improvement for Christiansburg High School. Uh, at Bellevue and Christiansburg High School, we were able uh, to replace the fire alarm panels and devices that were very old and we utilized some devices that actually were uh, salvaged from all the mobile units that we had at Old Christiansburg Middle School for BMS that we had to put in. We rented those units, but we had to buy those fire alarms and we had them stored and we were able to uh, come up uh, and basically modernize uh, the big one at Christiansburg High School, a great improvement. Uh, from the original almost 40-year-old fire alarm system to a new one, and Bellevue the same. Uh, we were able to get uh, parking lots repaved at Christiansburg Elementary, where you could see the schools there, CPS, Bellevue, Gilbert Linkus, and those were completed. We were also able to uh, start replacing the windows that are in process at the facilities department uh, before they actually fell out, uh, they're in process. <laughs> And the town just started, you'll notice, the town just started the sidewalk in front of our uh, building there at facilities. And we've been wanting to replace that retaining wall that was crumbling for years and years. So we're taking the opportunity to sell out a whole lot of money to do that so we don't have to rip out new sidewalk to replace the retaining walls. And uh, right at the end of the year, uh, we found a bad leak in the boiler at Old Christiansburg Middle School, the lower building where the programs were moving back into ISS and Rivendell, and we were able to get get that. The cost to repair it was about two thirds of the cost to replace it. it was such an old boiler, uh, we thought the investment was best because we can also sell. It's of a size that we can, if we need to, salvage it and use it at. I think three different schools we figured. So a lot uh, going on there in a short time, a lot of uh, work getting done. Uh, the smaller projects, the PTA and booster projects, uh, the ones that are highlighted are the ones that have some action on them. Unfortunately, the track uh, at BHS, you know, the boosters are bought the rubber surface for the track. Uh, it was contingent upon that track being perfect according to the specifications, both longitudinally the whole quarter mile and cross slope uh, limitations that they have and also uh, the neatness across the slope as far as the levelness of the slope. Very difficult spec we found when the rubber track uh, contractor came that uh, the original asphalt track uh, was not uh, to spec. We didn't realize how far, how many different places. We thought it was only a couple that uh, could be done easily. But uh, contractor, we brought them back, showed them, uh, and they've attempted, I believe, uh, four times to uh, remill and repave that track. and as late as Friday and Monday, they remilled the track again, and they'll be paving it this week. Uh, we still believe we could get the rubber surface in uh, this year. The Harding Avenue a Safe Routes to School Trail, uh, the town did not get that started this summer. They did get the design complete. It's out to bid, and that will soon start. The one at Margaret Beaks, they were able to complete the path portion of it. I don't know if you've been there. Uh, I don't think they have the fence complete in the back, uh, nor the signs, but for all intents and purposes, the path is complete and connected to the neighborhood path that's behind the school. Uh, and
and that was done by actually the Public Works uh, Department of the Town of Blacksburg. We also, uh, well, Christiansburg High School's project to uh, upgrade their audio, audio system in the auditorium. If any of you were at the grand opening uh, ceremony, you heard that, and it's uh, a really good improvement uh, to the auditorium there. Uh, the murals there at Beeks are in progress. A, a couple new ones that came in at the end of the year, one of them's already finished, the second to the bottom. That was moving the practice goals that they had put on the middle school fields. They moved them uh, up to the new high school multipurpose fields. And then there's uh, a couple new ones. The last line is actually two separate projects. One's for additional uh, steps to the tennis courts up the bank uh, to supplement the paved path that goes to the tennis courts and also the Rotary Club uh, I think of the Noon Club of Blacksburg is sponsoring uh, a windbreak of trees at two sides of the two windward sides of the tennis courts and we're we just received those and we're in the process of reviewing those The slide that you cannot read, but I will give you the <laughs> updates. Uh, I'd, I'd like to give you all the information the county gives us. I will tell you the update, updated items are uh, former Prices Fork Elementary School. Uh, the Board of Supervisors rezoned the property for development at their May 27th meeting. I think we had a meeting that uh, same week and I announced that, but they updated their status report saying that they did that. The other two are the next two, the former Shawsville Elementary School. Uh, they've surveyed the property, and apparently the Board of Supervisors are currently discussing the next steps for that property. I think because there's a large section of that property is parks and rec fields, uh, they're considering uh, do they keep the whole property or do they just keep the parks and rec fields portion and sell off the rest. I'm not sure exactly, but they're in discussions. And the former central office on Junkin Street, they were planning, I think, to a actively advertise this that this summer. They, uh, I don't think they were able to get to that, but they update this that they plan to uh, offer the property for sale later this year. And the other thing I wanted to mention was uh, uh, Jason's going to talk about the Auburn Middle School update, but I did want to mention we put out that we're going to have the tours for Auburn Middle School uh, tomorrow, Thursday, and Friday, and also Tuesday. I want to let you know uh, Wendell and Todd King will be tomorrow right now. Uh, Sarah and Joey will be on Thursday. We have you there. And Mary Biggs on Friday. And so far we have uh, Goonan and uh, Matt Gabriel for Tuesday. So if anyone else would like to go, and if you can't go on those times, I'm more than willing to make separate arrangements uh, with you so you can see it. Dan, so. could you add me to the Tuesday one? I thought I was on there. Tuesday? Yes. I thought I emailed you back. I'm sorry. Tuesday the 26th. Yeah. I don't have you on this okay. sheet, but I'm sorry. I'll put you it's down. Okay. Thank you. What time is it to roll? It's five. Five. Okay. Five. Thank you. Okay. okay. So, with the former Blacksburg Middle School, still no movement, just sitting there, right? There's no update, ma'am. There's an article in the paper about it here about mm -hmm. a week or two ago. They're going to be yeah, subcommittee in the process of. Process of getting together. If I could have a penny for every person who's been on a subcommittee or a committee for that building, I wouldn't have to go to work. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank Dan. You, At this time, Jason Peck, uh, would you please um, come forward and give the board an update on the capital projects at uh, New Auburn Middle School? Good evening, school board members, Dr. Staten. Uh, thank you for allowing me the time to update you on Auburn Middle School. Uh, we've made a lot of progress over the summer, so we'll go through and take a look at what's been done. 
Uh, this is a view looking southwest. It's a view you would see if you're coming along Route 8. Uh, we have the metal roof over the student entry and main entry canopies nearing completion. Uh, in this photo, we have the base layer of the parking lot in place and some temporary lines shown. We now have the top coat on and most of the permanent striping done. Uh, this was prior to school starting, so we wanted some spaces there before, before we started. Is that the bus loop there to the left? It is. It is. That was my uh, next comment. Okay, the bus installed. loop uh, base paving is installed, and uh, we'll put the top layer in as weather permits. Uh, and also, uh, it'll be done on the weekend to uh, avoid the bus traffic as well. Uh, concrete sidewalk work is ongoing. This next slide is looking northeast, uh, as if you were looking from Auburn High School. Uh, the brick veneer is completed, and the drive at cornice is currently being installed. In this slide on the left is the student entry. We have the drive it complete, uh, the metal roof trim is ongoing, and the storefront is installed. To the right, uh, again, is the base paving and temporary parking lot for the teachers and visitors at uh, the existing middle school. In this next image, uh, the image to the left is the band room. We have the first coat of paint in, uh, ceiling grid, and duct work. And uh, under this floor protection is the uh, new VCT flooring system. Uh, in the right image is the existing auditorium. We've done some hard ceiling work there. Uh, ceiling grid is in, speakers, lighting, and some sprinkler rough ends. In the final slide uh, in the left, we have the administrative area reception. We have casework, ceiling grid, storefront doors, and lighting in. Uh, in the image to the right, this is in the old building uh, in one of the classrooms there, and we have casework installed in ceiling grid and lighting as well. Uh, the project remains on time and under budget currently. Good answer. <laughs> Board members, you have questions? No, nope. thank you. Okay, All right. thank, thank you, James. Thank you. Uh, board members, this final item, um, insurance for board members, is, was placed on the agenda at the request of the school board to give you um, an opportunity to discuss insurance and other benefits for members of the school board. Should the board decide to pursue providing additional fringe benefits for school board members, the board would need to amend policy 1-2.5 to reflect the change. If approved by the board, the earliest board members could join the insurance plan would be October of this year when the plan is renewed. So I present it for your um, discussion. Well, since I brought it up, <laughs> um, I did, uh, you know, one of one of my discussion pieces last when we brought it up two weeks ago. You know, I've been on the board nine years, and I've listened to everybody talk about not having raises, and and I've been on the board nine years, and not only have we not had a raise, but we, you know, don't have insurance benefits. Um, and I talked about it a few years ago, but you know, when we couldn't give any kind of raises to teachers there was no way that I could ask for something like that. But this year, since we've been able to do that and we've done some other things, I, and the insurance is changing, and I spoke with some Board of Supervisors and I found out that, you know, I mean, our districts are the same. We all run for election and I've had the privilege of being, and I have ran against three very strong opponents each time I've ran. And sometimes that's not the case in all of our seats, but I do think some of the things that comes along with compensation to a board gets other interests involved and we have to keep that in mind for when each one of us might decide we don't want to run again. So with that I looked at the Board of Supervisors and, and they make like twice what we make plus they have benefits plus they have the option for a phone and I did actually call a board member today and, and verify that before I said it. So. You know, it's up to us because I did speak to two and they said, well, that's up to the school board to vote on that at that point. So here I am. 
So who bears the cost? I don't know. How, how does this cost? I don't know. That's the that's. I mean, is this what part of the discussion? I mean, you how know. does this impact our budget when we? I don't know. <clears throat> you got anybody got any questions? I mean, it's a budgetary impact. That's what I want to know first. You can keep you can keep your jacket off. You don't. Want to. <laughs> <laughs> it's nearly ten o'clock. Come on, it's basically back on the clock now. <laughs> so Thank you, Mr. Stay Mayor. Warm. <laughs> you, yeah, you take the the rates that we currently have. Um, um, I believe it's going to be about six hundred thirty dollars a month, times twelve, which is about seventy two hundred dollars a year. Okay. So over. Because we couldn't offer any additional beyond what. I believe that's right. Anything additional, what we offer the employees, additional insurance to the board that we do to the employees, and that's what we would offer the any employee coming as well. Is that a single employee you just mentioned? Yes. Sir. What about a family? Employee only. Now the family rates I have in front of me. Hang on just a second. Let me grab those. Okay. $649, I'm sorry, for um, monthly costs. So you multiply that by 12 uh, for employee only. Family, um, again, the school board would um, pay the difference in the, the premium cost and the employee only cost. And so for a family, uh, that would cost an employee uh, $974 a month. That much? Yes, sir. And for me, I was meaning more just like employees have single subscriber, you know. And that's pretty much what I think the amenity that's offered to the board of supervisors. Yes, ma'am. That would be the cost of the school board regardless because each plan is just given the $649 toward the premium. Because the total premium for a family is $1624.85. I suppose the obvious questions are going to be, uh, obviously, as we vote on it, do each one of us need the insurance, and do we make it an option as opposed to uh, giving it to all the, the board members? Uh, then that raises another question. If someone opts out of it, do we compensate them for opting out of it? I mean, there's a lot of things for us to think through in doing this. Um, I do agree with Ms. Bond. I do think that there is, uh, you know, the supervisor, the board of supervisors do get some extra benefits, obviously, and maybe it is, it is a fair thing for us to do. I, I, I'm open for how we would discuss through that, um, but I do think we are we are opening up a can of worms uh, with those things in mind, whether or not each one of us would need it, want it, and if we would offer compensation otherwise. Well, and if I may, why, why would it be a can of worms for us, but it's not for them? I don't understand that. And, you know, that's kind of one of those, and I get that things have to be changed even for a raise, but, you know, and I think some people in the public think we make a tremendous amount of money and the 5,000 a year that we make covers very little. <laughs> it's, or not even that, it's for 4,800. And I, you know, so I think you know, the can know. of worms is the change. Right. It's the perception of the change. Exactly. So just with me kind of saying that to get it on public record so people don't think we make a fortune in doing this job, it, you know, it helps cover the time. Because like I said, even this year, we've not had so extreme amount of meetings. But the nine years I've been on the board, I've seen weeks when we've went a whole year and had meetings every single week and have gone many different places and took many days off 
that's my reasoning for asking this for in case this goes further than this room. <laughs> Mr. King, what, you have something? Mr. Chairman, members of the board, I just wanted to point out that to respond to Mr. Lyon's inquiries, the statute that governs this provision for the Board of Supervisors reads as follows. Members of each governing body may receive the same fringe benefits which are given to county employees generally. And it's from that statute that we have the, you all have the authority to adopt the same for yourself. So I don't believe that it's mandatorily imposed that seven of you receive it. All it says is if you on an individual basis would elect to participate, you could. The, we've, we just, in anticipation of tonight's discussion, pulled a couple of school board policies where they have done this, mm -hmm. and the language is very simple. School board members may participate in the division's group insurance plan. That's all mm -hmm. it says. Okay. So I believe that Mr. McAlandra's explanation is apt, which is you would get the employee contribution that other employees of the district right. get. If you want the family plan, you pay the difference. Right. You pay the employee's portion of an individual plan. Okay, understood, thank you. In the same from what I understand, like the cell phones for the other county, it's an option as well, like some took it and some didn't. So, with knowing all that information is why I felt I could bring it forward. I mean, I, I, as far as the health insurance goes, a board member here wants to participate in it. I mean, if we put it in our language, we voted. We have to vote as far as changing policy. Uh, if we vote in changing policy, mm -hmm. I, I think it should be an opt-in thing. And if the board member needs it, then I have no issues with that, as long as we understand the budgetary impact of that, right. the budgetary impact of it. Right. Well, I just yeah. figured I, I was just doing the math on it for this year and. I think I came up to right under $55,000 if all seven of us participated. Yeah, it's not cheap. So. <laughs> no, no health insurance is cheap. It's not. I pay quite a bit. Hmm. And understanding that, and if we made a lot of money, I wouldn't ask. And if we've had a raise in the last nine years, I wouldn't ask, but we have it and we don't. <laughs> and we give a lot of time and I just, I feel like we are deserving if we choose to do so. No. Well, I'll have to say that I ran for this position as a service job to this community. It was not at all to make any money. And I don't feel that, you know, it's, it's, it's a nice that I'm compensated a bit, but that is not why I'm sitting right here. So I don't feel th that this policy needs to be changed at this time. I don't, I don't think any of us ran for the money. So do. <laughs> I spent, man, well, that's not. I, no, I'm laughing because when I ran, I didn't know you got paid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Me either. I'm serious. Yeah. I didn't either. I'm serious. Yeah. I did not know you got paid. Yeah. I, that's not why I ran in the beginning, but after being involved, I I didn't know it until the article came out in the paper that I was running, and I read it, and I was like, oh, I get paid for this if I win? And that's how it all starts. Me too. Like I said, for me, I, I feel like we're deserving just like yeah. we fuss and fight for everyone else in this district to be treated fairly in this mm -hmm. county. I don't feel like we should be any different. The door's open for you. Yeah. So uh, the next step, though, to this board, do we want the administration to put policy together because <coughs> the next step as i see it is that we look at this as a policy update and mm -hmm. it comes back to the board to be voted on as a policy update i think so do we give administration direction to do that and bring it back to a another meeting i think before we do that i think we need to ask if anyone on the board is really interested in pursuing this if so then we need to it's kind of what i'm doing with yeah. policy updates yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm gonna add my two cents. Um, I too didn't know that you got anything for doing this other than the satisfaction of making sure that our kids were being educated properly. Um, and I have a, a, a big fear that when folks feel that they're gonna make money and there's gonna be fringe benefits that they'll run for the wrong reasons mm -hmm. and we'll have a bunch of people sitting up here who 
are sitting here because they want insurance or they want this or they want that and that's that's a huge concern for me you know I, I understand what you're saying Jamie and it would be very nice to be able to have the insurance that our employees have because mine is not as good as theirs is anymore it used to be but it's not anymore but I I just I just have a real concern about people running for the wrong reason and and I thought about that too and if I saw a lot of people running for the Board of Supervisors elections I would agree but I don't I don't see that happening there were two on or you know that ran against and my district seems to have the most you know opposition in both races and I, but I did think about that and that, that would be a concern but like I said I did I see what the Board of Supervisors were making and and their benefits and and I don't see a tremendous amount of people running for those offices yeah we're too small if you want to be a fat cat and you run for Congress <laughs> yeah you got to, <laughs> got something bigger. they're all fat cats I'll just say the grass is not always greener let's just move it that way yeah. <laughs> so do would, do we want the administration to bring this back as a policy update nah. no I'm seeing people shake their heads no I don't, I don't care or, I don't care I got one shaking their head we I, I think we I think we could at least hear what the policy update would be and where a suggested uh, you know run the numbers get the numbers and and have a suggested place to budget that from I mean I think we need to hear that before we say yay or nay I mean I would like it in the form of a policy update <coughs> yeah I'd like to bring it back as a policy update and we can vote and discuss yeah it. I mean we can vote on it then vote on it and vote it down or vote it up yes okay. well I think mr. King stated with the policy would probably be yeah yeah I'm trying to be a little bit more formal <laughs> about it that's all I'm trying to do this so, is just pure discussion right now yeah. but I'm you trying know. to understand does the policy say, policy say you can or that then you may so, you may so it's already there no, 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 he read it no, from the board of county. Board of that's the counties. I, I just pulled some from other school districts who have already adopted it, and it just mirrors the language of the statute, which says board members may participate in the group health insurance program. That's all it says. So that would be the extent yeah. of the policy? <laughs> yes. Yeah. So it we is optional in the sense. Right. It, it, would, we would, it would amend the current policy by right. adding that statement. Right. Okay, so I think if we make a a, uh, a presentation of that policy change at the, at our next meeting or in a future meeting, with the financial impact piece uh, presented at the same time, then we can make a decision. Okay, all right. You have your direction there, Mr. Oh, I have it, sir. All right, thank you. And that ends my. Uh, presentation for this yes, next item is unfinished business school board members, <coughs> we have any unfinished business yeah what, um, what what's going on with the doodle is that unfinished business that's another item I think on the agenda it's a, isn't it it's the next item underneath our capital planning meeting. gotcha does anybody have any other unfinished business if not we'll move to the capital planning meeting I finished a doodle poll but I didn't see where we all agree on the same no, day. I mean we have to just pick a date I don't think we're gonna agree on yeah the same uh, yeah so we're back to where we were so, well if you want to pick a date where there's six people out of seven you could do that like the last time I saw there were a couple of dates that were seven out of eight yeah yeah because we forgot. included Brenda. Brenda. okay yeah how did you get that right. no, I can tell you um, what those dates there was four dates where there was six out of seven seven out, seven out of eight people October 20th, 29th, October 9th, well, let me do October 9, October 16, October 20, and October 29. Seven of the eight people were available those four dates. Okay. Is that right? And I would assume that we need to pick the ones where Ms. Blackburn is definitely available. Did you, I'm pulling it up right now, but are, is she available in all those? Uh -huh. Okay. So since I'm that seventh person, um, I need to confirm a couple of dates tomorrow, but I think the 20th will work, but I need to confirm that. October is just a real busy month. Is it What's a Monday? It is a Monday. Yeah, it's a Monday. 
but I just need to confirm, make sure. <coughs> That's a Monday, right? October the 20th? That's correct. It's a Monday. Can you really say that's what it is? Yeah, I'll be I said more I need than to likely check. be available that, that, that week. You said you will? Yeah, I should be. What about the one of the 29th, just you, in case? You, you'll be here the 20th, won't you? Uh, yeah, at this point, I've got, yeah. there's two birthdays that week I'll have to be in town for. Or I might get shipped out west permanently. Okay, now I want to be clear. I still need to check right. on that date. So, who are you? Will you let me know or some of yeah. us know real quick and yes. I'll get the word yes. out? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So, the, the 29th was another day? And another Yeah. Okay. That was a Wednesday. So, Wednesday. Yeah. It didn't matter the days, the date. Yeah. Okay. I'll double check, make sure, because there's some changes. Okay. Any other items of unfinished business? New business by school board members. Yeah, I have a couple of things. Number one, this um, admissions policy. We need to look at that. We really need to take a close look at that. Well, if you look under the, definitions, the, it has the, the admission policy and, and the um, enroll at MCPS, which was on our web page. I haven't really looked at those. But do we need to take a close look at those to see if they're in sync with each other? Yeah, they're definitely not in sync. Uh, we're good. We're good. Well, if you look on the under definitions number one, it explains about the age. So I think we're pretty in sync, unless I'm missing something. Does it does it state what the web page was what that's on the web page? Enroll at MCPS? It says it before says exactly, September 30th. It says on the web page exactly what it says in policy. Yeah. If you okay. read, it says they both are maybe worded slightly different, but yeah. do we want, Dr. Graham, do you want to offer any insight to the board before we move forward with? The state of Virginia does allow you to enroll a child who has not yet reached their birthday by September 30th. However, I talked to the State Department and she said, some, some systems do that, but most do not. Um, you run into equity problems of a family that could pay tuition versus a family that couldn't, that had a four-year-old. The other expenditures where you, you have to test the child to see if they can come. Um, in that situation, you, you need to purchase tests, have the staffing to do the testing, and historically, we just have not done that. Um, I'm not sure what other questions you might have, but I'll talk to principals that have been here, and probably for the last 25 years, Montgomery County has not done it. I don't know past that. Um, parents can take advantage of private schools. They can homeschool. We do test children that come from private schools into the system. Usually they're coming in as a first grader, and we can use um, the end of the year test from kindergarten for that. And Children also have the opportunity, if you have an extremely bright child, that child can come to kindergarten after the, you know, at the correct age, at the age of five, and then we um, can refer them through the gifted program and accelerate should that be needed, which is very rare, but occasionally we do, have, we do accelerate a child and let them jump a grade. So if we have a parent who is willing uh, to pay for the test, willing to pay for tuition, and they pass the test, they demonstrate that they have the cognitive ability to, to do the work, then would we let them in? Probably this year we would not have, uh, simply because the enrollment is so high and the board had given us direction not to bring tuition-based children unless they were uh, children of an employee. So some of the decision making is based on enrollment numbers and our capacity and teacher ratio. Correct. Yes. Um, we so haven't accepted any out of district students other than uh, the students that had parents or teachers in the last um, two, three years. 
just just a little history from when my kids were enrolling in school, which a long time ago. Um, and my son, October the 15th. That's my son's birthday. <laughs> okay, I understand. <laughs> um, I believe in Montgomery County, it was based on the enrollment and how things were going up because at one time it was December that you could bring your child to school. And then it, they, over a period of years, rolled it back to September the 30th because my son made it in by 15 days because at that time it was October 30th and the next year it was October 1st. You know, so it's uh, enrollment was the big drive to do that. Now, if I'm a parent and I can't afford to have to pay for the tuition, pay for the testing, but I have a very bright child, how fair would it be right. that someone else could and their child could and mine can't? Nope. Well, and if I could piggyback having a, I mean, a third a daughter and talking to kindergarten teachers, from what I understand that years and years ago when they did it, it wasn't only about the brightness of the child, but that they found too that a lot of four-year-olds just didn't have the motor skills at that point. They needed those extra developing months because they couldn't hold crayons, they couldn't hold pencils. And, and we all know what six months makes in a difference in a child. And so, you know, with speaking to preschool and kindergarten teachers, those were the things they were sharing as well as why they felt like it needed to be that backed up date from years ago when it used to be December. So just a comment. Have you had this conversation with Mr. Edelman? Is that correct? We spoke on the phone. Okay. Um, okay. And it's also hard to decide. You know, you can take somebody's child with four days difference, but then somebody else might be short for a week, or the next person could be short a month. And then, you know, how you decide, plus or minus, how many days uh, you have to open the door to let the um, students in. You know, my kid will be two months, you know, before September 30th, yours will be two days. Seems like two days could be as ready as, you know, October 4th could be as ready as September 30th. But in any other case, if I'm trying to come with uh, a month difference, like you said, the social skills will make a huge difference. So then when you're gonna say no, how you're gonna say no will be an issue. Because um, there's so, 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 so the do it. So the answer to this particular situation was there's no room. That's, no. we just have not done this. Um, but enrollment this year would have, would have prevented, Prohibit. even if we said that we did test children enrollment this year, we would have okay. probably said no. Okay. Um, and the board decided several years ago not to take tuition yes. students unless their, uh, their parent worked in Montgomery County. Exactly. Hmm. So board members, do we pursue this or are we satisfied with the policy as written? Uh, as far as the issue of uh, being able to pay the tuition and you know, if anything is reading like that in here, you know, to get your child in, we need to be consistent. I do agree where the language does say, you know, it has reached the age of five on or before September 30th is consistent with the information that we were given tonight. And I guess there could be a question why then we have that maybe section on the admission number four. We probably did <clears throat> not need to have that section in the policy well, here, here's my suggestion. I haven't really read through all of this, and I'd like to. So I'd like to just do that and absorb what it says. And if I have a question or concern, I can bring it up at the next meeting as new business. Okay. Okay. All right. It's good enough for me. Good, yeah, good enough. Other new business? I just, um, real, real quickly, want to offer an apology for my statement when, during when we had to pay for the pay the bills right as I was getting ready to say my statement for my conflict of interest it deleted on my phone so I remembered about four words <laughs> what I was supposed to say so just wanted to offer my apologies that's the reason I was stumbling because I was looking at words that weren't there 
We uh, got it. <laughs> you're, you're good. Two other things with new business. We heard a thing tonight about if you're not at, you don't show up the first day of school, you're removed from the role. Can you clarify that real quick? That was my, thank you, that was my second. Yeah. Yeah, we're not allowed, students aren't allowed to be enrolled in school until they report for day one. Okay. And so um, that means that their schedule, then they don't have access to the same classes that they would have had if they had been there on day one. So they are putting themselves at a disadvantage if they're looking to have a class at the high school that's full, they will have less of a chance of getting in than they would if they had been there on the first day. And you notify the school and say you're gonna be gone that day? It doesn't work that way? No. Yeah, it was Unfortunately, it doesn't. You, yeah. We so can't no enroll students until there. they physically are in a yeah. seat. Do, is it a huge issue? I mean, and, and two questions. Is it a big issue and how widely is that known to parents that um, I'm not comfortable answering the second. I'd have to check on um, how widely known that is to parents. It's certainly a big deal to them if they don't have access to the courses that they want to take. Right. So for anyone who can't get into a course, it's certainly very important to them to have that course. Is um, it, it depends very much on the school and the course, whether there are seats available in it or not. That varies widely. Is it written then somewhere that you need to be at school the first day? I'll have to is check it, on that. Yeah. That probably will be the important thing to have if that's what you know we're doing. The mm -hmm. parents should know at least. I mean, absolutely. Under normal condition, you assume you be in the first day of school. I mean. And something that we probably need to over communicate. I would think. Yeah, because I mean that's a pretty serious thing. Now, this apply the policy applies across the board even to uh, to primary. Yeah, it applies everywhere. Well. The student can't be enrolled. But it's this. It's the high school. There just where aren't a where lot it becomes of the biggest for that. issue. Sure. Yeah, you still are having the chances are likely that you'll still have the same teacher mm -hmm. in elementary school, but at high school, I guess, those classes, you all know that have students fill up very quickly and change often in that first week. It's that it's that you know take it granted kind of. I mean, you you assume that you'll be in the first day of school, but there will be, I guess, extenuating circumstances sure. that they may have to miss it. So I guess they have to really know the consequences, you know. What legally, sure. you're supposed to show up. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I never thought about so legally not showing up. Be there first on the first day. day. <laughs> I would encourage you. Right. I'll have to check on how we communicate that and yeah. what's in writing. Yeah, yeah. That, that's the probably yeah, message. Absolutely. Uh, and then we heard a presentation on PE every day. Yes. Mm -hmm. Did you? Uh, was, I'd like more information on that. Yes. The two young ladies did a great yes. job presenting. Absolutely. Oh yeah. yeah. Would like to hear. Yeah, what that sounds like more we can do about idea. PE every day. Yeah, because we talked about that a lot in the mm -hmm. years I've been here, and especially when the scheduling changed at the middle school. We, we went down. When, uh, I yeah. Think. So. PE is required through what grade? Is it ninth or tenth? Tenth. Ninth and tenth, it's required. Right. Junior year is when it's right. Okay. But I'd also like to know what's going on as far as recesses, you know, at the elementary level. How much are these kids being able to get out and, <coughs> and move? Oh, excuse me. Any other items of new business? You see one item there under the uh, um, item B, and uh, we put the. Virginia School Board Association Conference and the NSB Conference for next year on the agenda so that you can start planning and let uh, Brenda, Ms. Drake know that you will be attending those meetings. Yes, these were added. You asked that in the future when hmm. board members yeah. would be traveling that we added that to the agenda for discussion. Yeah. So we put it here for tonight. I did a approximate cost if you want that information or I can hold it. For no, that time. would be great if you have it up to do okay. have approximate. The VSBA conference, the registration fee for that is about $300 and the cost at the hotel per night is $144. So we're looking about $588 per board member and then mileage and meals on top of that. The NSBA conference is significantly more expensive. They have this an open. Far away. <laughs> Yes, it's in Nashville this year. They haven't opened up registration, but best on, based on last year's data, the registration fee is around $725 a night. The hotels usually are right around $200 a night, and then we pay for your flight there. Last year, the cost per person was right around $1,500 per person. 
we typically only have one person that we send to that. Is that my understanding? There are it, it, it depends. Yeah. It depends. It really okay. depends, depends on people's schedules. We've okay. had as many as four or five go. Oh, okay. Um, it, it, well, we have one who actually rep, is a representative of us that, right next, Mr. Ivers, for this year. Okay. Okay. Well, I guess the other, uh, my question will be how we're going to, obviously we have limited funds, how are we going to decide how many of us should go or any, if one wants to pay their way or part of it, you know, <coughs> how are we going to handle that? Probably like if we all different. say we want to go, the, <clears throat> let's well, we went say over the, budget last year, so we are trying not to do that. Probably have to figure out how many are going first. How many want to go first? Yeah, so I think what, what I would encourage you to do is let Ms. Drake know that expressing interest in wanting to go. And then she will we'll come make back a decision. to the board and okay. say, here's the number okay. of people, exactly. and here's what the cost is going to be. Okay. And then we'll say yes or no. Okay. That. Yeah. That's what I was That's wondering. how I would approach it. Sounds For both good. of them. Yeah, but mm -hmm. interesting. I, I, I would highly encourage. I think it, to me, it's very important because in all the ones I've been to, uh, it's obvious that there are a lot of boards that uh, see that as an opportunity for their board to get together and do some yeah. activities outside of the boardroom yeah. together as a board, especially at the national convention. Yeah. I mean, you see a lot of boards there together, yeah. okay, at these national yeah. conventions. Um, plus, it's, plus, it's a great learning. Uh, yeah, my first uh, experience yeah, I mean, was the, wonderful. That's, that's, the, the, that's the main point. The seminars, <laughs> learning. The seminars are phenomenal. Mm. The music at the national convention is wonderful, too. Yeah. They do a wonderful job with the music. Okay, any other new business? Announcements and information? Hearing none, agenda prep. And you see the next coming, upcoming school board meetings. And with that, I seek a motion for adjournment. So moved. Second. All those in favor signify saying aye. 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 We adjourn. Thank you all. Safe travels home, everyone. Nice job. Thank you. Yeah,